Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks so much for joining us. Please let me know in the chat box if you can hear me well. Yes, okay, perfect. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for coming here today to our verbal refresher class and welcome to Admit Master. We are about to start. We're super excited. Yeah. Today we get to learn more about verbal and um, some people call this section an English section, right? When I ask people, you know, what's there on the GMAT, they'll say, well, there's math in English. So uh, let me, let me perhaps uh, share with you that this is not a test of English and that just for fun, since we are doing this workshop, we are doing most of our GMAT workshops in partnership with uh, some of the best business schools. And uh, today we're doing one with the John Molson School of Business from Concordia University in beautiful Montreal, downtown Montreal. And uh, this is an English speaking school in a French uh, province. So I wanted to give you a 10 second lesson in French. Does anybody know what is the French word for to take? Please put it in the chat box if you know. Prendre, yes, thank you. Many, many of you know, of course, that's prendre. And what's the French word for to learn. Apprendre. So you, you see, in the French language, these two words have the same root. And the reason why I wanted to share this with you is please take as much as possible from this workshop. This is not about passively sitting and listening. This is about engaging with the workshop, asking questions. We're gonna use the poll, we're going to be using the chat, and uh, normally in our classes, you'd also be on a camera and we'll be able to interact uh, with these uh, free workshops. We usually have a lot more people that uh, we could possibly have on a webcam. But if you were to be in our actual live class, then you would be on a webcam and we'll be able to see each other. Uh, the session will be recorded. Yes, the session will be recorded and we'll share it with you and you have access to it for the next few days. So today is about the verbal section, and that is why I wanted to do a verbal question with you. Again, grab a pen and paper, or um, you could just simply use your memory to look at this question. We are going to be tackling a critical reason question. I wanted to, for you to get a feel of what it's like to do a verbal reason question. Then, of course, I'm going to share with you the strategies of how you can attack the verbal reason section. This is what today is all about. Uh, we will be talking a little bit about how to study for the test. I'll give you uh, a plan of where you can go next. And uh, we'll also hear from the representative of one of our partner schools who will share with you the admission tips and tricks. It is going to be something you cannot see on the website. So it's not like an advertisement for the school. It is uh, truly some really interesting tips and tricks. I always learn something new. And uh, this is what you will also learn at the end of the seminar tonight. So let's take a look at the question. Here is a question. You will see that um, there's a bit of a dialogue going on and uh, there's a question about that dialogue. So I'll let you read it for about 30 seconds or so. All right, wonderful. Does anybody have a chance to read this passage? Yes. You understand it well? Yes. Okay, perfect. So what I'm going to do now is I will show you the answer choices. And uh, the passage is going to disappear because we don't really have time to read the passage more than once or twice or three times. So however many times you've read this. So this is not a very hard passage. You should definitely be able to understand what was going on there. So let me show you the answer choices and I will launch a quick poll. Once you think you know what the answer is, just please choose it in the poll and I will talk about this question in a few moments. 
Oh, great. I see answers coming in. I'll give you another 10, 15 seconds. Please choose an answer that you think best fits the question, and then we'll talk about this in a moment. Uh, to vote, you'll just use a poll. Uh, there's a poll that should have popped up on your screen, and then you can choose your answer there in the poll. Okay, wonderful. Let me hand the poll right now. And if you're if you're watching this seminar on a mobile phone, then you might not see the poll. The poll might cover your screen, but it should be a window that pops up. So let me end the poll. Let me actually share with you what everybody has chosen. So it looks like we have uh, quite a few people for D, slightly fewer people for B, um, a few people for C and E, and nobody really for A. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's take a look back at the passage. Now, this is a passage about human evolution. It's about anthropology. So let me ask you a question. Do you need to be an expert in human evolution if you want to do well on the GMAT? What do you think? Absolutely not. So this is not about understanding human evolution. This is about answering the question. And the question was asking, what is Jamal doing to respond to Sasha? So you would notice that Sasha is saying, well, this is what happened. This is how our ancestors evolved. They ate lots, lots of meat. And Jamal was saying, well, wait a second. Yeah, they did, but they also had to work physically. And people today don't work physically as much as our ancestors had to work. So maybe that diet doesn't necessarily apply to them anymore. Maybe not to the same degree. So that's what he's doing. But when you look at the answer choices, they are actually a lot more confusing. Did anybody find the answer choices more confusing than the passage itself? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's what makes this question a harder question. The passage was relatively easy. The answer choices are a bit harder. And you would notice that some answer choices don't even talk about human evolution at all. For example, answer to C, it just doesn't even mention human evolution. And in fact, because this is not a question from an anthropology class, but rather from the GMAT class or from the GMAT exam, we need to focus on different things here, not on human evolution, but rather on what will help us answer the question. What exactly is Jamal doing? Now, the question was, what is he doing? So let's focus on different keywords here. Is he refuting? Is he qualifying? Is he supporting or broadening? Is he questioning the assumptions about conclusions of human evolution? Or is he expressing doubts? What exactly was he doing? Hmm. Okay, well, I guess we need to be a little more careful and maybe go through this with a bit more attention to detail to understand what exactly he was doing here. Now, many of Many of you here chose the answer to is D. So let's take a look at D first, and then we'll come back to uh, the other answer to So D says, question whether her assumption about our prehistoric ancestors permits any conclusions about human evolution. So did she ever make any assumptions about prehistoric ancestors? And did he ever really question any conclusions about human evolution? No, he didn't say that. He just said, maybe the diet doesn't apply to modern people anymore. But he never questioned any conclusions about human evolution. So 
Certainly D wouldn't be the right answer. Uh, let's look at E because E is actually often a very popular answer. So I'm quite impressed that not too many people pick E. Usually in my classes, when we do this question for the first time on these workshops, a lot of people are gonna pick E because E says expressing doubt whether most human beings today are as healthy as our prehistoric ancestors were. Now, uh, he did say that people today are not as physically active, but please let me know in the chat box, is being physically active the same as being healthy? What do you think? Do these mean the same? No, uh, I mean, technically, if we try to compare people today who are not physically active versus people today who are physically active, you would probably notice that most people who are physically active are generally more healthy. But we're not trying to compare people today with other people today. We're trying to compare people today with our ancestors. And I don't know if you know anything about human evolution. You certainly don't need to, but even a couple hundred years ago, people barely lived to 40 years old. And now people live almost up to 100. And uh, we didn't have uh, any of the medication. So certainly people died very young and they were not healthy at all. So we make our own assumptions and we basically get outside of the scope of this question a little when we're answering E. But E certainly is not the right answer. He is not talking about the health of people today. Okay, so D and E are on, let's keep going up. Let's actually start from the top and look at A. A says refuting her statement about our prehistoric ancestors. None of you chose this answer choice because I think you understand by now that he didn't really question any statements about prehistoric ancestors. Uh, so A is also wrong. Well, that leaves us with B and C. And if you look at B and C, one of them qualifies the conclusion, another one supports and broadens it. And you're gonna see this quite often in critical reasoning is you get the two answer choices and both of them seem like they somewhat answer the question. But very often one of them will correctly answer the question and one of them will not answer the question or maybe answer the wrong question or the opposite question. So what does it mean qualify? And what does it mean support and broaden? Well, qualify actually means narrow down, redefine, whereas support and broaden also means redefine but make the definition wider, broader, as opposed to qualify, make the definition narrower, right? So I could say, all people in Canada love cold weather. If I want to qualify this, I'll say, well, actually what I meant by that is um, all people who live in the far north and, and enjoy being outside in the winter, they love cold, cold weather. Right? So I'm qualifying, I'm, I'm narrowing it down. I'm saying, well, maybe it doesn't apply always. It just applies in some cases. And broaden will just mean if it applies in some cases, it certainly will apply to more cases. So what do you think the author was doing here? What, what was Jamal doing? Was he trying to narrow down or broaden the conclusion? What do you think? Narrow down. He was trying to qualify the conclusion. He was trying to say, well, that actually doesn't really work always. And that's why B is the right answer. Now, if you answer this question and you have no idea what exactly they argued about, and you still don't understand the part about human evolution, that's totally fine. Not a problem at all. In fact, when you're approaching the test, I was just talking to somebody a couple of days ago who is now taking our course that started yesterday. And this person was telling me, look, I really hate the GMAT. I said, I, I would love for the GMAT to be the simple test when I can read a book, I can memorize stuff from the book, and I just go for the test and the test is asking me what's in a book. And I, I guess I'm, I have a really good memory, so I'll get a good score. And I'll say, well, you know what? Unfortunately, that's not how the test works. So uh, we can't unfortunately change the test or we need to adapt, adapt our studies to succeed on the test. And uh, 
please don't take my word for it. Here's a quote from the GMAC, people who make the test. They say, rather than testing your knowledge of business or any other subject matter, including human evolution, the GMAT example measure higher order reasoning skills. Notice we used our reasoning skills. Some of the skills we used here were number one, attention to detail. Number two, we use the process of elimination, which is a part of your reasoning skills. You have some right answers and some wrong answers. So there's a set of different skills. Here at Admit Master, we call them thinking like a CEO skills. And if you come to our class, we're gonna go through them one by one and you will actually learn how to start thinking on a higher level, like a senior manager or a CEO. Because once you do the GMAT, we still want to make sure that you have a benefit of studying for the GMAT. And it's not just getting into a good business school and perhaps with a big scholarship, but it's also about developing the right skill set. Because the GMAT is a very advanced test. It requires only basic knowledge of the things you learn in middle school and high school. And maybe even a little from elementary school. Primarily, it is testing how well you can think on a different level. Unfortunately for many of us, uh, we haven't really been trained to study that way. Uh, most of us were told in school that knowledge is power. And if you have a library card, you can be very successful. How much do you believe that? Many of my teachers told this to me and it didn't really quite work out. I remember my history teacher told this to me and you know, the stuff she taught me wasn't even all true because I was studying in a former communist country. So knowledge isn't really power. What is the power now is a skill. Because if I want to know something, I just need to ask Google. But if I don't know what to ask or how to ask, that's a problem and that's a skill. And what to do with that information, that's a skill. In fact, coming back to that question about having an English section on the GMAT, if you look at the structure of the test, you would notice there is no word English, but the word reasoning appears there for three times. And the word analytical appears there once as well. So it is really all about the skill. In fact, this slide was taken from the presentation made by the GMAC to test prep organizations such as ours. We get invited every year to go and visit the GMAC headquarters and mingle with people who work for the GMAC. And this was actually the slide from their presentation. And they said, well, when you talk to, about the GMAT to your students, please tell them this is about reasoning. So that's what they need to focus on. Now, quantitative reasoning and verbal reasoning sections are the two sections that actually contribute towards the total score, 200 to 800. The other two sections do not contribute. However, they still are important. And uh, we are going, we normally would offer the mass refresher and the verbal refresher class. So in our verbal refresher class, which is today, we are going to cover all three of the verbal reasoning question types. Uh, in the next class, the next quantitative class, uh, we had a class a week ago. So our next class is on March 29th. And then sometime in April, we are also going to have the AWA refresher class where we are actually gonna go through some of the writing techniques. So please make sure that you stay tuned and watch out for our emails. Uh, this is going to be presented by a really, really good instructor who is actually a professional writer. So you can learn some of the tips and tricks, not only how to write a very good 6.0 essay on the GMAT, but also how to develop very impactful essays. So that's coming your way in April. But for now, we're talking about verbal. So let me ask you a question. And Again, I would like to ask you for some participation. Could you please tell me, is the verbal reasoning section hard? And uh, I believe you can choose more than one option. Please tell me, why do you believe it is hard? Why some people might believe it might be hard for them? What do you think? Okay, so far I see a few people answering several answer choices look right. Yeah, I mean, realistically, if you think about this, when you have a mass question, if the question's asking you two times three, well, that's gonna be six. Yeah, three to the power of two, that's nine. 
But on the verbal section, how do I know which sentence is better? So it certainly seems like uh, the answer choices are subjective. And that's a very popular answer, by the way. So far, the most popular answer. Because mass is not subjective, but verbal is. Many people say mass is more black and white. And verbal is a lot more gray. We can agree to disagree on what's the right answer or the best answer in verbal. Well, let me give you a little bit of a secret about the GMAT. The verbal section on the GMAT is a lot more black and white and a lot less gray than what most people think. In fact, I started teaching a class yesterday, uh, the new six week course. And in our very first class, uh, this is a verbal reasoning class. And uh, <laughs> there was one student who raised her hand at the end of the class and she said, I understand that the verbal is not as subjective as, as I thought, because we just need to know what to look for. And if we do, then we can choose the answers as confidently as we would in math. Now, just to give you a little bit of a preview of what's coming your way in the master pressure class, the mass is actually a lot more gray than what most people think. Because the only way for us to be completely sure about the mass answer is to actually do all the calculations and solve a problem and find a numerical answer. Very often, you wouldn't have time for that. So you will actually have to decide what is the answer without completing the calculations. And that makes it a lot more gray than what most people think. So let's actually talk about the verbal section. What is it that we need to know? What are the strategies? What are the techniques? What are the rules that we need to know? And of course, we're gonna to try to cover as much as we possibly can. There's only so much that I can teach you in these two hours, but I'd love to uh, at least give you some of the more important things about the verbal section. So when it comes to sentence correction, I wanted to ask you a question. What do you think is being corrected in a sentence? Because obviously, if they're giving us a sentence and supposedly they're asking us to correct it, uh, what could be wrong with the sentence? Let me know in the chat box, please. What could be a problem in a sentence? Here I am saying grammar, grammar, structure, yeah. So you're absolutely right. Grammar is one of the things that's being tested. However, this is not the only thing that's being tested. And by the way, we call grammar the rules of how we structure the sentences. That's what we call grammar. So grammar and structure, kind of synonyms when it talk, we talk about sentence correction. Now, but this is not the only thing that's being tested. Sentences also might also must convey appropriate meaning, and the meaning must be clear and unambiguous. And the sentences also should use direct, clear communication style. So these are the three things that are being tested. Now, grammar is a little bit easier for most people because there are certain specific rules, or at least this is what many people think, especially if English is not your first language, and maybe you are speaking a language that is actually the proper language is a proper grammar. You might be thinking the same applies to English. But if English is your first language, you probably know that English isn't really a pure language. We have words from all kinds of other languages. That's why we have so many words. English has over half a million words. An average person speaks about two to 3,000 words. And the closest languages, such as German and Hungarian, they have about 100,000 words. So can you imagine English has so many words? And of course, the more words, from different languages, the more exceptions. We also have to different grammar rules. That's what makes English a little nasty and a little annoying to work with, even though it's one of the easiest languages to learn. But let me give you good news. Even though we have so many rules and even more exceptions in the English language, the great news is that the GMAT doesn't test all of them and certainly doesn't test vocabulary, how well you know half a million words. What the GMAT does test is a small number of English grammar rules because the idea of sentence correction is not to test how well you know English. That's why we have IELTS, TOEFL, and other tests for that. But it is something else. And I'll show you in a few moments what actually is being tested. 
incidence correction? What skills are being tested? So let's talk about some very foundational rules of the structure of an English language. In the English language, any sentence that's used to describe something must contain as a minimum two words. These two words together are called a clause and every sentence must contain at least one clause. Does anybody know what roles do these two words play in a sentence? We must have a blank. We also must have a blank. Does anybody know what these two blanks are? By the way, this is not the case about other languages. Italian, uh, Spanish, uh, some of the other languages, you could actually have just one word and it's perfectly fine. And most of you pick this up. Uh, you do need a verb and you do need a subject. Actually a noun and a verb or a subject and a predicate, the, the proper terms, but let's just call them subject and a verb, even though they're two different things, part of speech and part of sentence, but that's okay. That's what most people understand. So we need the subject and we need a verb and the subject and the verb must agree. What it means, what does it mean to agree? That means if you are talking about one subject, you must be using a singular verb. If you're talking about plural subjects, you must be using plural verbs. We say a child plays. We also say children, which is plural by the way, play. Very simple rule, but actually one of the rules that are being tested on the GMAT. So you might wonder, uh, well, geez, uh, you know, it's so simple. How could they possibly test it? But remember, this is not about being an expert in grammar. In fact, let's practice a little. I'd like to show you five sentences and I'll launch a quick poll and I'll keep track of your progress here. And once I see most of you have answered, we're going to talk about these five sentences. So please choose an answer that you think fits the best among the two verbs given in both. Okay, well, I see most of you have answered. If uh, you still haven't picked the answer, oh, I see that uh, the answers are coming in. Okay, wonderful. So let's actually review these sentences. Let me end the poll and share the results with you. So as you will see, a bit of a disagreement. Uh, a few more, a, a bit less disagreement in the first one, it was was, second one, live. The third one, uh, well, a bit more, about 30% of people said takes, and about 60%, 60, 70% of people said take. Uh, also number four, about 20% of people said has, and about 80% of people said have. And also quite a bit of disagreement in number five, about 60% of people said has, and about 40% of people said have. Hmm. Okay, uh, so maybe this rule is not as easy as it seems since certainly some of us didn't pick the right option. And by the way, there is only one right option, correct option that's going to fit these sentences. So we can't really say this two different ways. We must use one of these options. So let's look at number one. Most of, uh, most of you have chosen was, and uh, the answer is indeed was, because what was the subject here? The subject was the crowd. So how many crowds do we have? Only one. We call this the collective 
subject or collective noun. These would be words such as crowd, or audience, or family. Even though it consists of multiple people, it's still only one crowd. So we need to use singular. If we say the crowds, that would be different. But here we have a crowd. How about number two? Uh, most people chose live. And the question then becomes, what's the subject? Well, the subject here is uh, Amy and Bobby. So how many people are part of the subject? Well, uh, Amy and Bobby, <laughs> that's two people. And two is more than one. So we need to use plural. And the correct answer is live in Boston. Number three, Jason, as well as his two friends, takes to take a GMAT prep course. Just to remind you, about 70% of people said take, about 30% of people said takes, and the 30% of people are correct. The answer is actually takes and not take. Let me ask you a question. What's the subject in three? Is it Jason as well as his two friends? Which is kind of almost like Jason and his two friends, right? We use these words interchangeably, but they actually mean different things. And means we're talking about the list. If I'm saying Amy and Bobby, and then I'll just drop Bobby and just say Amy, the meaning of my sentence will change because I'm just then talking about one person, not about two. However, if you look at number two or number three about Jason, we do not have the word and. And that means we do not have a list. So we're not talking about Jason and his two friends. So what's the subject then? Well, the subject here will actually be Jason. As well as his two friends is called the modifier phrase. It's an additional information that adds more clarity to the question, but doesn't actually change the meaning of the sentence in a way that if we drop it, the sentence will still make sense. So if we say Jason takes a GMAT prep course, that still makes sense. As well as his two friends, that's extra information. And if you're wondering why two friends are not the subject, well, if the two friends were a subject, then Jason is not the subject. And then we'll just say, as well as his two friends take a GMAT prep course, uh, you don't really start the sentence with as well as. Especially on the GMAT where you just have one sentence. There are no sentences before it, no sentences after. So it has to be a complete standalone sentence. And if you want to make a note of this, we call this the AND rule. That says, if you have an AND in a sentence, and if AND lists out parts of the subject, then you will always have a plural verb. And if you don't have and, you need to find a subject. And the subject here was Jason. That's why it's Jason takes a GMAT prep course. Number four, by the way, if you have any questions, just please throw them in the chat box. In number four, we had less than 20% of people chose has, and over 80% of people chose have. And guess what? I think you might be surprised to learn that 18% of people are now correct. Yes, the answer is indeed has and not have. You might be a little even maybe more surprised about number four than number three, because you're thinking, okay, well, I'm talking about brothers and I'm talking about Susan. There's more than one, definitely. So I should say have. But see, this is a bit different because now we talk about or and not and. That is different. If we say Amy and Bobby live in Boston, we know both of them do. If we're saying Amy or Bobby live in Boston, then it's quite likely that only one of them does. So even though it sounds terrible, the proper English would be Amy and Amy or Bobby lives in Boston. When we talk about brothers or Susan, well, we have brothers that are plural and Susan that are singular. So if you have any sort of a structure where you're saying plural or singular, the rule says 
that you need to look at the verb and find the subject that is the closest to the verb. This is called the proximity rule. And you will need to match the number of the verb with the number of the subject that is closest to it. So what was the right option there in number four? Has, because Susan is singular and Susan was closer to the verb than the brothers. Any questions, please let me know in the chat box. Number five, the board of directors. This is a tricky one. Slightly more people chose has, but uh, almost half of the people chose have. Because when you really think about this, who actually decided to fire the CEO? Now, we could probably argue that it were the directors that fired the CEO. Or we could say it was the board. Could have been the board of directors. But um, who actually made the decision? Uh, it's actually not that clear from that sentence. You might also remember that the board is just like a crowd. It is singular. There's only one board. And directors, of course, are plural. So that's why even some people might think this is subjective. Uh, you know, Some people would use plural and some people would use singular. But there is actually a rule. And before we understand this rule, I wanted to mention something very important. And that is that not every noun in a sentence is actually a subject. If we say John reads a book, well, what's the subject? The sentence is about John. John reads a book. So what is John doing? The predicate or the verb is reads. But what about a book? What is the book doing there? Uh, nothing. So the book is called an object which is a noun that doesn't do anything in a sentence. Now, it is even more confusing once you start using passive voice. For example, if we say the book is being read by John, the book is actually doing something. The book is being read and John's not doing anything. So John becomes an object. I know that's confusing, but that's English grammar. By the way, the GMAT prefers active voice, but you will see passive voice sometimes. So that's why when you look at the sentence, you will usually have a lot of different nouns because obviously verbs only describe an action. So generally in a sentence, you have maybe one, maybe two verbs. Whenever you have a clause, you will have a verb, some sort of an action. But in terms of a noun, we can have so many of them. We can have so many different modifiers, adjectives and adverbs. That's what makes the sentence complex and long. So we need to be able to determine what's actually a subject and what is not, if we want to know what verb to use. And the important thing to remember is that only subjects must agree with verbs because obviously subjects do something and verbs don't, uh, sorry, and objects don't. And because objects don't, they don't have a verb to actually agree with. So that brings us back to our super useful rule. And that is a rule of a preposition. Does anybody remember what's a proposition by any chance? Maybe the middle school grammar comes back to you. Prepositions are very short words. Examples of prepositions are of, in, for, to. These are very common. Uh, into, about, all of these are prepositions. I am reading a book about the United States of America. So about would be a preposition. I am giving this book to my student, to the preposition. So why is this important? Why is it important for us to learn prepositions? Even though technically, the GMAT will never ask you for the grammar terminology. They always give you a sentence and you need to correct this sentence. It is because Whenever you have a preposition, what comes after the preposition is always an object. It's never a subject. This is just how English grammar works. So if you see something like the board of directors, of was a preposition. So directors are not the subject. Well, I guess that leaves us with the board. 
And that's why the right answer was the board has decided. So please remember the rule of proposition. It's extremely useful when you are dealing with subject verb agreement. By the way, the subject verb agreement, what we just covered, is one of the big areas in sentence correction that the GMAT is testing quite often. You'll definitely see questions testing subject verb agreement. However, this is not the only agreement that is tested on the GMAT. There is one more agreement that is also quite common. And that is the agreement of pronouns with nouns. As well as if a pronoun is a subject, they also need to agree with a verb. Because so far we talked about a subject and a verb. And a subject is usually a noun. But you can also have a pronoun. Words such as I, them, they, it, and so on. So these pronouns, they replace nouns. We use them instead of nouns. We could say Sergey is teaching a class, or we could say I am teaching a class. So when we replace pronouns, we also need to make sure we use proper pronouns. Because when we're replacing something, there is a chance we made a mistake. And there are actually two things you need to make sure when you are seeing a pronoun. Number one, is that the pronoun refers very clearly to the noun it's replacing. So when you see that pronoun, you know exactly what it means. And number two, it actually agrees with the noun it's replacing. And if it replaces a subject, it must also agree with the verb because then obviously that pronoun is performing an action. So that's agreement, subject, verb, as well as a pronoun. Let me know if you have any questions in the chat box. And in the meantime, I have a couple of questions for you. And the first question is, in this sentence, is the pronoun used properly? Why yes or why no? Hey, some people are saying yes, some people are saying no. So if you say no, let me know why. And if you say yes, let me know why as well. Now, who is she? Somebody's feeling unwell, right? And uh, Elizabeth is in the hospital and Melissa is going to visit her. So, uh, I mean, technically, we could say that if Elizabeth is in the hospital, she is feeling unwell, so the meaning is somewhat clear. Well, on the same token, Elizabeth could be a doctor. And Elizabeth is visiting, or Melissa is visiting a doctor in a hospital. Now, by the way, somebody mentioned that what if Elizabeth is a boy? Um, the GMAT will never test gender specific pronouns. So please do not worry about trying to understand what's the gender of something or somebody that is mentioned. Uh, that's not going to be certainly your concern on the GMAT. What they do, though, test is uh, we'll actually take a, a couple of examples of what they do test. But I wanted to give you one more example. So here, she certainly was not used properly. If we want to correct the sentence, we'll probably have to repeat the name again, or we might have to say the former or the latter. That might be a better option. Let's take a look at another example. I love shopping at Walmart because they have good prices. What do you think? Is the pronoun here used properly? Why yes or why not? I mean, that's how we speak, right? Say, I I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to Walmart. They have a really good sale today, right? Or they got this stuff on sale, so I'm gonna go and buy it. Mm. Yeah, again, some of you are saying, yes, it is used properly because that's how we speak. But let me ask you a question. What is Walmart? Is Walmart they? No. Walmart's a name of a company. So when we talk about the Walmart, we need to say it because it's a thing. It's a company. The company is it and not they. Please try to tell someone, I'm going to go to Walmart because it has a sale. People are going to look at you and say, what? Are you speaking proper English? Okay. 
I love shopping at Walmart because it has good prices. Wow, who talks like that? But that is proper written English because Walmart's the name of a company. So we need to say it. We cannot say a company, they. Companies, they, but a company is not they. A company is it. Okay, let me ask you another question. This GMAT class, is it for you and I or you and me? What's the proper way of saying this? Is it you and I or you and me? Most of the people are saying you and I. By the way, we wouldn't say Walmart. Walmart is not proper English. Walmart stores would be proper English. So um, it's interesting because you is the same in both. So why don't we focus on just the me or just the I? Let's drop the you. You makes no difference here. So if you want to know uh, what's proper, and by the way, sometimes you and I is proper and sometimes you and me is proper. So if you want to know what is proper, just drop the things that are the same and focus on the things that are different. Do we say this GMAT class is for I or do we say the GMAT class is for me? I think by now it makes total sense that the GMAT class is for you and me. The GMAT loves hiding things very cleverly. And the same thing, by the way, in the second example, who or whom is this class for? Let me ask you a question. Can anybody say honestly, and please raise, raise your hand if you do, that you can honestly say that you always use who or whom properly in your everyday spoken language? One person raising the hand. Musa, are you uh, are you raising the hand because you want to say that you always use who or whom properly, or do you have a question? Yeah, we usually don't, and that is why we need again to have a rule. And the rule is the rule of a subjective versus objective pronoun. Who is a subject? Whom is an object? This sounds like a bit too much theory. So let me give you a simpler way of dealing with who or whom. Simply answer the question. And if the answer is them, the question should have been whom. And if the answer is they, the question should have been who. So uh, who is this class for? It's for they or is it for them? It's for them. So that's why it's whom. That's certainly not how we speak. Right? But again, even if you are a native speaker, sometimes your knowledge of English could actually play tricks with you because the way we speak is not always proper. Uh, in other words, uh, we don't talk good. But uh, I think many of us are going to talk gooder once we learn some of the rules of the English grammar on the GMAT. In fact, for some of the people whose language, English is the first language, this will be the first time you will be learning English grammar. Sounds super exciting, right? But again, remember, there's only a very small number of rules we actually need to learn. All right, I think it is time for us to actually look at the real question because we've learned a lot of theory now, we've learned some rules. So why don't we try to apply these rules to a question that actually appeared in one of the past exams. Let me show you a question. Here is a question. This is a sentence correction question. You would notice a part of that sentence is underlined. And you have five options for that underlined part. Option A is the same as the original sentence. And option B, C, D, and E offer you other versions of the same underlined part. So in about a minute and a half, you need to pick the one that you like the most, that in your opinion will fit that sentence the best. So here you go, about a minute and a half.
Okay, I still see that uh, quite a lot of people didn't answer the question, but a few of you have already. So yes, you are choosing an option that you think will fit the original sentence the best. And once you do choose an option, can you please let me know in the chat box, why did you choose that option? What was the reason? And was there any specific rule that maybe you've used? Uh, is it just maybe because that particular answer looked the best to you or sounded the best? Let me know in the chat box. I'll just give you another 20 seconds or so, maybe 30 seconds, and then we'll talk about this question. So let me know in the chat box, why did you choose that answer? All right, well, thank you so much for sharing some of your responses. Uh, uh, some of you were saying, um, well, actually, let me show you what the answer choices look like. So here, as you could see, C is the most popular answer. And most of you said that C uses this proper subject verb agreement. Uh, some of you said it sounds better, it's very clear. Um, also, some of you chose E. You said, look, E looked best because it's a singular swast that the sentence is talking about. Um, D and E sounded strange because uh, we use D for the species. So why would we do that? And A, B, A and B don't work right. So C should work right. Um, some of you are saying C is a little more clear. Okay, so, so far, nobody chose D, C, E, B and A. So let's actually take a look at what could be the correct answer. Uh, obviously, one of them is correct answer, certainly not D, but uh, hopefully it's C that most of you have chosen. Maybe it's C, so let's try to break the tie. First of all, sentence correction is something that requires quite a bit of a degree of focus. And the GMAT in general requires a lot of focus, but sentence correction specifically, you do need to focus very carefully because one word or one even letter in the word may make a whole difference. You add an S at the end of the word, things change completely. So if you look at the answer choices, I don't know if any of you actually looked at the answer choices real quick before you started reading them, you might have noticed a pattern. And the pattern there was A, B, and C say SWAS, and D and E say the SWAS. So obviously only one of them could be correct. And there's a pretty big difference between SWAS and the SWAS. So hopefully, if we decide whether we need many SWAS or just one SWAS, we could hopefully cut down to the number of options. So uh, let's take a look. Uh, so far, we've learned two agreement rules, the subject verb agreement, and the pronoun agreement. So let's focus on the subject verb agreement first. Obviously, if you have plural subject and singular subject, let's take a look at the verbs. What do the verbs do? Well, A says swas hang. Uh, so far so good, they're both plural. B says swas hang. Yeah, that's the same. C says swas use. Okay, yeah, both plural. So far so good. So far all of them were good. Uh, hopefully D and E are not going to, but let's take a look. D says the swas hangs. Oh wait, they're both singular. And E says the swas hangs. Also both singular. So how are we supposed to make a decision if they technically give us the correct subject verb agreement in all five? And if I want to understand whether we need a plural or a singular, I can't really use just pure logic because uh, I can't just say, wow, there's more than one swath for sure, because maybe we're talking about the species, just like some of you correctly mentioned. When we refer to the swaths, we could be referring to all swaths collectively as a species, 
of the psoas, and that's perfectly fine, by the way. Nothing wrong with using the name of the species to describe the behavior of that species. So we can't really use the subject verb agreement, but how are we supposed to then decide if we need plural or singular? So some of you also mentioned that, uh, well, it's really helpful to use a, have maybe have a pronoun in a sentence, right? Because if the subject verb agreement didn't help us, maybe the pronoun agreement would help us. And uh, they didn't underline any pronoun, but wait a second. Right at the very end of the sentence, we see the pronoun it's twice. It's coat and it's toes. So could we say it's coat if we talk about many swaths? No, we can't. If you say it's, it must be one. Otherwise, we would say their coats. So A, B, and C are out. And honestly, I don't even care how it sounds and whether it looks the best. It's wrong because it uses the wrong subject. I must use a singular subject because it must agree with the non underlined pronoun it's. Ooh. That's interesting. So some of you mentioned, but the original sentence as was. Well, remember, the original sentence could also be incorrect because the original sentence is the same as answer choice A. And A is correct only one out of five chances. Oh, I guess so now we are down to, we're down to two answer choices. So the original sentence, again, it may not necessarily be correct. There might be a problem with the original sentence. It sometimes is correct, in which case you're gonna choose answer choice A, but sometimes it isn't correct, in which case we're gonna choose something else. In this case, we've determined it is actually not correct. So now we're down to two answer choices, D and E. And I noticed one person put in, in the chat that you've chosen D, but it didn't show up in the poll. Uh, okay. Uh, so that's great. I guess we have one person for D, a lot more people for E. So E has to be the right answer, right? No. The right answer here, the correct answer is actually D. And if you want to know why, there's a rule in E that's broken. And that is not really the rule that I taught you yet. But if you've eliminated A, B, and C, and you got down to D and E, congratulations. And uh, you certainly have learned the rule. And if you didn't, then congratulations, you got more to learn and you got more to practice. And you kind of understand this is not just a test of memorizing rules. So why is it D and not E? Because E uses improper list, or what we sometimes call parallel structure. So E says the source hangs from trees, comma, sleeps, comma, and it moves. Is it okay to say the source hangs, sleeps, and it moves? No, that's not proper English. I wanna say the source hangs, sleeps, and moves, but I don't want to say the source hangs, sleeps, and it moves. This is not how we create lists. So that little pronoun, it, ruined everything for us in E. And that's why D is the right answer. So you might be looking at D and say, oh, wait a second, it sounds terrible. And it actually isn't. It says, this horse hangs from trees by its run or limbs, comma, sleeping 15 hours a day and moving so infrequently. So sleeping and moving, they're called adjectives or adverbs modifiers. In this case, they actually call participles. Again, you don't need to know any of these terms. But what is important is that sleeping and moving are not verbs. They're descriptor words that describe how the swath hangs. The swath hangs, how does it hang? Or, or it hang? It hangs sleeping and moving. That's why D is the right answer. And of course, we eliminated everything else. So I guess that's the only one that's left. 
Let me know in the chat box if you found this interesting. I want to tell you something that really I want you to remember from this part of our class. And that is, in sentence correction, please don't choose what sounds right, looks right, or feels right, because the GMAT knows that this is what people choose. Instead, what is really tested in sentence correction is this. And how do I know this? I got a chance to, in one of these conferences where we get invited by the GMAT, we get a chance to actually talk to somebody who is responsible for developing sentence correction questions. This person came in, and we had a chance to network and spend some time together. And we asked, well, tell us what's really tested. Some people say it's the meaning. And some people say it's a grammar. And what this person said, none of the above. What's really tested is this. We want future managers to have a good attention to detail. Grammar rules, anybody can learn. You can teach people subject verb agreement and pronoun agreement in 15 minutes. Then you give them the question and everybody makes a mistake. Why? Because we haven't yet learned the skill. We haven't learned the proper attention to detail. And that's what we want people to develop as they are taking your course and as they are getting ready for the GMAT. And what else is being tested? Clarity of communication. It's very important that when you read the sentence, that's why meaning is important. There's no ambiguity. Because guess what? When you become a future CEO of a company, some big company, multi-million dollar company after your MBA, you will be signing some contracts. And if you sign a contract that has some ambiguity in it, or maybe the comma is not in the right place, that could cost the company tens of millions of dollars. So that's very, very important. And ultimately, we have so little time for sentence correction because guess what? You have less than two minutes per question in the verbal reasoning section. But there's a lot more to read in critical reasoning what's coming next and reading comprehension, which we're also gonna talk about today. So you really just barely have a bit more than a minute. And I noticed some of you mentioned you didn't even finish reading the whole sentence. And I gave you two minutes. So this is a skill we're going to need to develop. And unfortunately, we have to develop it. We can, we can try to be angry with the GMAT, but it is what it is. And it's a test that's supposedly fair to everyone. At least it's, you know, it's the same for everyone. Now, uh, somebody was asking in the choice. Uh, OK, so the choice A, almost copy paste of the original set. It is not almost. It is the exact copy paste. So. Answer choice A in sentence correction is always exactly the same as the original sentence because one out of five times, it is actually correct. There's nothing wrong with the original sentence about 20% of the time. But 80% of the time, there's something wrong and we need to choose B, C, D, O, E. Ooh, sounds easy, right? I wish the GMAT were this easy. I wish it were. Let me know what you think about this sentence. Was, yeah, everybody saying was? Was, yes. Everybody agrees it's was. The right answer is where. You might be looking at this and scratching your head. Wait a second. Where? The GMAT? It's not the GMATs. We know how to properly spell the GMAT. It's a test. So why is it where and not was? Well, because this is actually not true. Let me give you an example. I wish I were you. Why do we say I wish I were you? Shouldn't we say I wish I was you? Uh, I, I'm not plural. I don't have a split personality yet. Well, we say where because we use what's called the subjunctive mood. This is something that is not true. That's why where is also appropriate here because the GMAT's not easy, but I wish it were easy. Sounds like fun, right? So this will take some time and it will take some commitment. And I wanted to show you a little bit what will it take and then we'll talk about the other sections. Some of you may have seen this. This is the GMAT funnel. If anybody's familiar with the sales and marketing, this is how the GMAT essentially finds its customers. You who are going to be doing the test. So here's what they do is they 
of course, uh, they work through different business schools and they have people going on the website, mba.com, a couple of other websites like businessbecausegmat.com. About 7 million people a year will think about doing the GMAT. Of them, about 2 million people will begin studying for the GMAT every single year. Guess how many people will see through till the end of their journey and will actually do the test? You may have seen me say this before, 10%. So 90% of people who will study for the test and then I will say, not for me, too hard. I don't really understand this. I keep making mistakes. I've learned all the rules. I read all the books, but I still keep not getting a good score on my practice test. So it's not even worth it to go and pay 250, 300, 400 dollars, depending on what currency you're paying in to actually do the test. And of the 200,000, 10% of people that will do the test, only about 10% of those people will score 700 or more. Anybody wants a 700, let me know. Let me know in the chat box. This is a really good score to target. Yeah, perfect, yes. That's a really good score to target. As some of you mentioned 770, wow, that's impressive. 770 is a less than the top 1%. So really good score to target for a variety of reasons. First of all, it gives you so many options because if you get a really good score above 700, 730, then you can apply to any school in the world. As long as the rest of your profile fits, you will be able to demonstrate you are a very competitive candidate if you were able to pass through all of this selection process. Secondly, usually for the majority of business schools, a high GMAT score will help you get a pretty good scholarship. A lot of our students uh, that uh, get good GMAT scores, and usually most of our students get higher scores than they wanted to. I had one of our students just uh, a week ago did the test and uh, scored more than what he wanted and said, well, I'm going to go to a better school and now I actually will have a chance to get a scholarship. So on average, our students will get like twenty, thirty thousand dollars in scholarships, and sometimes even more. One of our students got what one hundred and seventy thousand dollars scholarship. She had a seven hundred forty score GMAT. Of course, we also helped her prepare the rest of the applications, so she looked very competitive. Uh, you can also, if you are looking to get recruited out of the MBA program into some competitive industry, such as maybe consulting or investment banking. The companies that come to hire on campus, right, such as maybe McKinsey or Goldman Sachs, they'll ask you, what was your GMAT score? They often will not ask you for your grades, but they will ask you for your GMAT score because the GMAT is the same for everyone. And if you want to apply to these very competitive industries, they want to use every opportunity to cut down on the interview process because they can't interview everyone. So they're just going to go to their target schools, the top schools, and they're just going to say, I we just want to interview people who have GMAT above 700. You know, we don't really have time. We're really busy people. So 700 plus scores are certainly very valuable. And it's also a little bit of a bragging right. Now you might be worried whether you can get a 700 plus score, if especially maybe English is not your first language. Here's an example of one of our students, Natasha. She came to us uh, literally maybe a week after she um, got off the plane. She came from Brazil. English was her third language. She was an engineer by training. And uh, after about two months studying intensively, taking our course for six weeks and studying a little bit more on her own, doing more practice, she was able to score 96 percentile in verbal, 92nd percentile overall. 96 percentile in verbal, by the way, that is very impressive. That means she beat 96 percent of people, of whom at least half are native speakers because she developed the right attention to detail and she knew exactly what to look for. And most importantly, she trusted the system that this is a standardized test. So there are standardized ways to beat the test, the standardized patterns. So there's certainly hope and it's more than a hope. There is a plan. I'm gonna share the plan with you in a few moments, but I wanted to briefly talk about two other types of questions. A little more time on critical reasoning, and I'll give you a couple of tips in reading comprehension. We are not going to have the time to read the full passage today. The critical reason is about an argument. So uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen an argument? Have you ever seen people argue? Yeah, I bet you have. Uh, but see, on the GMAT, unlike the first question we did today with Sasha and Jamal, usually arguments are made by one person. 
And we call them arguments because they have two things, a fact and an opinion. We call an opinion a conclusion or the main point or a main idea or a claim of an argument. Let me give you an example of an argument. Today, I attended an awesome GMAT class. I don't know about you, but I love this class. I think it's awesome. And I take my preparation seriously and make the right decisions. Therefore, I will get a high score on the GMAT. What is my opinion? What's the main idea? What am I trying to say? What's your point? It's important to be able to understand the point. The point here is I will get a high score in the GMAT. But if I simply say I'll get a high score in the GMAT, you may or may not believe me. So I need to support my claim or my conclusion. And I'll support it with some evidence. And the evidence here in this case would be why? Why do I believe that opinion? Why do I say that conclusion? Well, it's simply because I take my preparation seriously. I make the right decisions. That's why I'll get a high score on the GMAT. So that's the basic structure of an argument. We have a conclusion and we have an evidence. Being able to find the conclusion and find the evidence in the argument is really important. Sometimes the GMAT will ask you to do something with the argument. In fact, let me show you an argument. And I'll give you two minutes to work through this argument. So now you see the question, the passage, as well as five answer choices. And the question simply asking you, which one of the following, if true, most strongly supports the hypothesis? So you're given a hypothesis in the question, you're given five different statements, and they ask you, which one supports this argument or this hypothesis the most? So please take two minutes and pick the answer. Please don't Google this question. Please just use your judgment or whatever you think is necessary to do this question in the next two minutes. So far, it's been a minute and 30 seconds. You have another 30 seconds. And if you have already chosen the answer, then please let me know in the chat box why. All right, well, it's been almost two minutes and 30 seconds. Let me go ahead and end the poll and share with you what we have chosen collectively. As you could see, an overwhelming majority picked B, uh, a lot fewer people picked C, a few people picked A, nobody for E and nobody for E. So how did we choose an answer? 
Well, there are a few ways to do this. One of the ways that um, some of you may have used is what's called the sounds right way, which essentially is going to read the passage, read the question, read the answer choices, and see which one actually makes the most sense. Right? Because in fact, some people are going to say, well, the verbal section is just, you just choose what makes the most sense. Well, let me know in the chat box, how many times did you read this passage? Because I'll be honest with you, at first, it's a bit hard to understand what's going on here. But we got to move forward. We have two minutes per question, and uh, the test is not going to continue until we pick an answer. So we got to make a choice. So let's actually see what maybe makes the most sense. A sounds kind of a little weird. Bronze ceremonial drinking vessels, what do they have to do with the earthquake? B sounds interesting because uh, we're talking about Cyprus, we're talking about earthquake, we're talking about the AD 365, which kind of checks all boxes so far. So let's keep it aside for now. Uh, C talks about coins. This have to do with coins. Uh, we never talked about coins. So uh, now that sounds weird. Small statues, stone inscriptions. Looks like all of these are kind of a little bit out of scope. So um, B works the best, but uh, maybe we're not completely sure. So let's go back and read the passage again. Maybe we'll read the answer choices again. And I'll say, okay, time's up, B. And I stopped you after two and a half minutes and I've noticed probably about half of the people still haven't voted. So that means we could potentially spend even more time. Let me know in the chat box if this is an approach that approximately you did. Yes, thank you. Uh, so maybe there's something else we can do here. One of the things we could do is we could learn some rules. And one of the rules, so let's say you read a book, if it's a good GMAT book, we'll say, in, in critical reason, you should read the question first. Why do we read the question first? Because we want to understand what is the question asking? It's a lot easier to find the answer if you know what the question asking. So the question here was asking, what will most strongly support the hypothesis? That's a strength and question. We're trying to make the argument better, stronger. We're trying to support it. So how are we going to do this? Well, of course, then, then we'll read the passage. We identify the conclusion and the evidence. The conclusion is our hypothesis, and the evidence is it was this excavation, and we thought it was the earthquake. And then we'll be going to be looking for the answer choice that actually supports that hypothesis, that makes it stronger. So if we learn some rules and we're very focused and we know it's a strength in question, then we're going to look at answer choice A and say, well, it doesn't seem relevant. But B, well, it supports the hypothesis. It certainly strengthened it because we hypothesized it was this earthquake, and most modern history has actually mentioned that. So it looks like our hypothesis was correct. So it looks like this is going to strengthen our conclusion. And for similar reasons to A, C, D, and E, do not work correct. They kind of seem irrelevant. And that's why, even if we learn some rules, maybe we read a book, we're going to pick B, same answer. Maybe we'll do this a little faster, a little more confidently. But guess what? B is not the right answer. Ooh, what has just happened? Well, let's look at a different way of approaching this question. Let's call it the mastery way. We call our program GMAT Mastery. So it's really not about learning history. It's about mastering the test. So how can we master this test? Well, knowing the type of a question is still important. It's a very good advice. Look at the question, say, that's a strength in question. I'm supposed to strengthen my hypothesis. But what is it that I'm going to strengthen? I can only strengthen something I don't know. If I know already something, I can strengthen it because I already know it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read the passage. We'll identify the conclusion and the evidence. And the conclusion here was that the destruction was due to this earthquake. But the evidence was that we have some excavation. We believe that the destruction was caused by an earthquake. And we also know that in AD 365, there was an earthquake. What we don't know is which earthquake destroyed the town. So far, there is not enough information in the passage. So the author is making some assumptions. And the assumption here, it was this specific earthquake destroyed the town. 
tell me, please, based on the information in the passage, is it possible that there might have been some other earthquake that actually destroyed the town? We know the town was destroyed by some earthquake. We know there was an earthquake in 365, but what tells us there was that specific earthquake? Totally possible it was another earthquake. So the author is overlooking an alternative explanation that there might have been some other earthquake. And we are going to be looking for something that actually clarifies something we don't know. Does A help us clarify something we don't know? No, it doesn't. Preceding and following 365, drinking vessels. So how does it help us understand whether that earthquake destroyed the town or some other earthquake? B was such a clever trap by the GMAT. This is a real GMAT question, by the way, from one of the past exams. Because in B, they're trying to support something we already know. They already told us at the end of the paragraph that the earthquake is known to have occurred. So we already know it. If it's known to have occurred, that means we know it. So we cannot strengthen something we know. We can only support a strength in something we do not know. So let's take a look at C. C says, after 365, there were no coins. But before 365, we have lots of coins. So what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that something big happened in 365. Some sort of a huge disruption happened in AD 365. We don't really know what it is, but if we knew that there was a big disruption happening in 365, and we also knew that the town was destroyed by an earthquake, and we also knew that there was actually an earthquake in 365, does it kind of help us suggest that maybe that's actually what happened? Absolutely. This becomes a stronger argument. We haven't really proven it 100%, but that's not what the question was asking us. It didn't ask us to prove the hypothesis. It asked us to support the hypothesis, and we did. Based on C, we know that it's very likely that the town was destroyed in 365. Otherwise, why would have, we have no more coins? And because there was an earthquake, it's likely that that earthquake actually destroyed the town. And if we know what we're doing, if we know what to look for, we can literally do this in less than a minute. I know it sounds like we can't at this moment, but trust me, it is possible to do once you learn all of this. So let's talk very briefly, and I see Christopher has joined us from JMSB, so we'll talk in a few minutes about what it actually takes outside of the GMA to apply to business school. There's going to be some really useful tips and tricks you cannot find on the website, so please prepare your questions as well. But I want to talk about reading comprehension, and of course, we are not going to be reading the passage. And one of the reasons why I don't want to read the passage here, because I can only imagine that none of you will get super excited once I start reading reading comprehension, right? Because let's be honest, they are really boring. I don't know if you try to read reading comprehension, it's not something exciting like what happened to Elon Musk or you know, some sort of a novel. No, it's some really boring, usually technical stuff. So how can we deal with it? And how can the GMAT give us something about, let's say, astronomy if you have a maybe a political science background? Well, it is because what passages are about is actually completely irrelevant. We usually read because we want to understand what the author is saying. What we're actually going to focus on is not what the author is saying, but how is the author saying? That's a very different way of looking at the passage. And that is why if you don't know anything about that subject matter, it's okay. In fact, if you don't know very much about that subject matter by the time you finish reading the passage and answering your questions, it honestly doesn't matter. As long as you picked out the right information or the right insights, the right structure to answer the questions, that's all that it matters. So when you're reading a passage, instead of actually saying, oh, the passage was about uh, you know, this theory, and here's what it does, and there's a molecule, and it interacts with this molecule, and here's what happens. And I didn't really understand it on the first attempt, but after 10 times, I do finally understand it, how the molecules react. You're going to be reading very differently. So let me show you how you are going to be reading. And in our class, in our GMAT Mastery Program, we spend about two, two and a half hours actually teaching you how to read step by step. We go through different keywords. 
work at different structures of how the passages could be organized. But here within the short time we have today, I wanna give you the overall idea of how you are going to read. In fact, if you want to start practicing tonight or tomorrow, you can totally do that. It's exactly the same steps that we will teach you in a class. Just we'll go a little deeper if you take our class. So the first thing you're going to focus when you are reading the passage is what is the structure of the passage? You're going to primarily be focusing on the purpose of each of the paragraphs. Sometimes you'll break it down even to smaller parts, sometimes to parts of the paragraph. But usually just for the time being, especially if you're reading more popular literature as opposed to very technical journals, you can focus on each paragraph at a time. So ask yourself a question. Why was this paragraph there? Why did the author talk about the old theory in the first paragraph if the whole passage is really about the new theory, what was the reason? Was it maybe to compare or maybe to explain why it doesn't work? But why was it there? And you're going to do this for every single paragraph. You'll be taking some notes. So if you come to a class, we're also gonna show you how to take notes and what proper notes to take and how to use them in the future. But I would really suggest that you take some very short notes as you're reading. As you finish reading the entire passage, you're going to ask yourself, Three more questions. Question number one, what was the passage about? If I were to write a title for this passage, what would the title be? Number three, or number two, question two, step three. What was the tone or emotion behind the author's words? And actually, in other words, what does the author think about that topic? Because one of the most common types of questions in reading comprehension, take about 40% of reading comprehension, is a question that asks you to agree or disagree with the author of an article. That means they can ask you about something that's not directly mentioned in the passage, but it's something you need to infer from the passage. That's why it's gonna be really important to understand what the author thinks. And finally, what is the primary purpose of the entire passage? Why did the author write this? What was the reason? And the reason, by the way, was never to make your wife miserable in the GMAT. Because all of these passages were written for technical journals, peer review journals. You can find them in a library, in some sort of a technical library where you would go to do some research if you're a PhD student. So what was the purpose? And there are different purposes. There are actually four different purposes that, that the author can write. And based on this purpose, you're gonna be able to deconstruct the passage and very clearly see how you can actually answer the questions. There's always more than one question per passage. Usually you're gonna see three to four questions per passage. You're going to see these questions appearing one at a time. However, the passage is going to stay on the screen until you're done with those questions. Sounds like fun, right? Please feel free to take a screenshot. We'll I'm also, also going to send you an email tomorrow. And in that email, I will be listing out all of these steps. And I would recommend if you do really want to do well on a test, that you begin reading differently. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before I let you go, and before we talk about the rest of the application, I want to talk a bit about the resources, because I know some of you have already been here and some of you are coming here for the first time. And when I talk about the resources, I usually say, please take anything you see on the internet with a huge, huge, huge pinch of salt. Because I was just um, you know, talking to someone recently and the person said, I'm really struggling with this uh, self-study online course. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time with this course and I'm not seeing progress. And uh, when I actually purchased this course, I saw people online just saying, Look, I used this course in two weeks. I got my score, 730, 750. And I thought, wow, I can do the same. And here I am six months later. So can you tell me what am I doing wrong? So please take that with a huge pinch of salt. In fact, I'm going to give you my own experience. And I'm, I'm sharing this with you, not because I necessarily think you might be able to do the same. You might do better or you might do worse. So when I needed to do my test, I literally learned about the test like a month and a half before the deadline. I said, oh gosh, I got to do this test. 
And they say, how do I do this test? I asked the school, and at that time, it was 20 years ago, they just said, well, go on the website, mba.com, you'll find all the information, you can take a practice test. And that's why, for example, now, if you go on the John Molson School of Business website, if you look at the GMAT page, there'll actually be a suggestion to take a practice test. And I would very highly recommend that you do. I noticed uh, some people, they, they go, they sign up to take a practice test, and then they never do. They're a bit afraid, right? They're afraid to see that low score. Uh, it's okay. This is not a prognostic test. It's a diagnostic test. So when I did the first test, I scored 650. I thought it was pretty good, but it also helped me understand what I was missing. And I worked on that. And for me, luckily, it was something simple that was missing. So it took me about a week to work on what actually was missing. And I got a score of 700 a week later on the practice test. And because 700 was technically enough for the school where I wanted to go, I booked a real test. And actually, I walked out of the test and said, Wow, you got a 750, that's top 1%. We don't have too many people getting this score here. I'm like, wow, really? Okay, I guess that's a good score if you say so. I didn't really know much about the GMAT. Now I've been teaching the GMAT for 14 years, but you know, at that time, like, it's just very, very fresh. So the whole process took me two weeks. And by the way, here's my official score report. I got 750. Uh, and some of you have seen this funny picture that I've shown you before that I am by no stretch of imagination Albert Einstein. In fact, I'm just a normal guy. And it took me many, many years to learn these strategies. And I've been teaching the GMAT for 14 years. I am pretty good. But I can still be better. I learn every single day. Because when I serve you in a class, I want to make sure you get the best service and you get the best teaching. So I continue to get training. I get some psychology, psychological training as well, how to work with people, um, sometimes with different um, different challenges and sometimes with learning disabilities. So we focus really a lot. It's a very inclusive environment. So when you come, it's also very personal here at Admit Master. And one of the reasons why I do this and why I love teaching, I, actually the, the interesting story, I was just talking to one of our students recently who uh, went to school in California. She couldn't do math for the life of her. Like it was so bad, really, like really bad when she came to the class. And I was just talking to her, she finished her MBA about five years ago. And she said, Sergey, you know what? Actually, I am now teaching kids how to compete in math Olympiads. I said, wait a second. Didn't you like really not know how to multiply 15 times seven? And she's like, yeah, you did. But you know, you inspired me. So now I'm actually teaching them. Like, wow, this is really impressive. So I had a, my inspiration was my math teacher. And I'm still very grateful. That's why I love doing this work. And that's why I love seeing stories such as maybe Dylan who, uh, worked for a consulting firm and said, guys, I don't have time. I work like 60 hour work weeks on a good week. I need a 740 because that's what I need for my school, at least a 730. Can you help me? Tell me exactly what to do. I don't have time to fool around. You know, I don't have time to watch so many YouTube videos where people say, oh, I did this and I did that. I'm going to experiment. No, I need to know exactly what to do. And he was able to get a score of 740 in just four months. It's very, very impressive. So ladies and gentlemen, I wanna give you a plan. It will take maybe three to four minutes and then we'll get Chris to come in and share some of the tips. So here's a plan. Here's how you are going to prepare for the test. Some of you might be able to take our course. Some of you might not be able to. I'm very grateful for the fact that you found the time to come here because this is my opportunity to serve you. I, I, I like to joke with people that I'm retired. I, I, I really am. Because I had a corporate career, I left this corporate career, and I do something I really love. So I see myself doing this for as long as I, I want to. So for me, it's very enjoyable to teach this class. If you come to us, that's great. I love working with you, and we have some really amazing instructors. But here's how we are going to do this. You're going to follow the same process that you followed when you learned how to drive a car, because the GMAT is not a knowledge-based test. It's a skills-based test. If I ask you how to drive a car, you're not going to give me the 18 steps you had to follow when you first got into a car. I bet you don't even remember these 18 steps. When I ask you, what would it take for you to drive a car? You'll just say, I just need the keys in the car. Make sure there's gas in the car. Right? How many steps are there to drive a car? Like, uh, one step. <laughs> you know, I just get in the car and drive. When you learned how to drive the first time, there were 18 steps. And you got to make sure you remember them. So that's the process we're going to follow. And 
in this process of learning, our phase number one is going to be, we have to review the theory. I noticed some of you here are already taking our classes in March, April. There's one person who's taking our class in June. So you've already got access to our resources. This helps you review the theory. We want to make sure by the time you come to the class and begin learning the strategies, the really cool stuff is gonna help you get a 700 plus score on the GMAT is you're comfortable adding fractions. You know what's an adjective and what's an adverb, right? You know how to convert the ratio to a fraction, how to estimate the square root of a three digit integer, some of the more basic things. That's what you're going to be doing before you come to class. And if you're really afraid of math, don't worry. This is all gonna come. I've literally had people who didn't even pick math in high school. It took them about two to three weeks and they were able to ace the theory and then start learning the strategies. If you're really afraid of math, maybe it'll take you a little longer just to overcome that fear, but again, we'll help you with that as well. There's some really good books and resources that will help you, and we're always here to help. So it was step one, you learn the rules. Step two, at that time, you said, well, I, I need to start learning how to do it. I know that green means go and red means stop, but how do I go? We got into a car and we started driving. And if you remember, you didn't get into a car all by yourself because we can crush the car. So we had somebody who showed us how to do it. If we had a good teacher, they taught us the best strategies up front, And that's why we probably became good drivers because we have good teachers because they're certified. And maybe they have good personality because they give us good feedback. They're very gentle. And the feedback is so important because the first time you try something, you'll make mistakes. I mean, I taught you a pronoun agreement today. We tried a question, almost everybody made a mistake. So you're gonna be making mistakes and it's important to get that feedback and to recognize how you can fix your mistakes. You want to study efficiently, this is the key to the process. Many people say, I just need to practice. But you know, practice is only step number three because when you're practicing, you're developing new habits. The more you practice something, let's say you have a way of doing a question, and maybe that's a way of kind of what feels right. You do a thousand questions. Well, boy, you're going to be really good at answering questions based on what feels right. Now it becomes a habit. Now it's so much harder to break it. That's why a lot of people who study for a while, they see such a slow progress because they just keep doing the same thing over and over again. But practice is the third step. That's why for us to get fully licensed, for example, in the province of Ontario, you will need to drive then for about eight to 12 months. And then only you can get full license because practice makes a habit. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes a habit. So three steps. Learn the theory first. If you come to a class, this is included in the course. And you come to the class for six or 12 weeks. In fact, let me show you how our classes work in case any of you are interested in coming to study with us. Our classes are six or 12 weeks. You can choose to take one class a week or two classes a week. We're very gentle in our preparation. We'll give you a chance to retake classes for free if you need a refresher for one year. We're gonna coach you all throughout the program. There are office hours every week. These office hours are unlimited for a year. So you can keep coming even after the class is over. We will give you three personal tutoring sessions. So if anything's not clear after the class, you can come in, we're gonna work with you one-on-one. -on -one. Essentially, we're going to coach you and we'll even help you a little bit with your application. We'll give you all the study materials, everything that you need will be included in this course. And right now, because you came here, we have a special offer for you. If you register for our next class or any of our next classes, you can save $200. You can find the pricing on our website, adminmaster.com forward slash offer. The class on March 25th, you could still register with $200 discount. Now, if you are interested, what I'm going to do is, as we're just wrapping up here, I'm actually gonna ask you one important question. And that is to think about how important is the MBA for you? And how committed you will be to this process? And let me show you two examples. One person is Fionn. She is a nurse. Oh, certainly during the time when she was studying for the GMAT, she was a nurse. She was working long shifts, sometimes overnight. She also had four other jobs. But she called me about eight months after she took the course, eight or nine months. 
And she said, Sergey, I just got this amazing score 760. Can you tell me, like, what can I do with it now? Where can I go? And I said, Wow, Fionn, this is really impressive, by the way, since Fionn, since then, Fionn recommended many of her friends. And she, by the way, herself was recommended to a friend that's now working in private equity, which is the industry that's really hard to get into. And um, she was saying, look, I, I was just really committed. I, I knew it's going to take me a long time because I have just so little time in my week. I have literally just a few hours a week I can possibly spend. But I said, I'm not going to give up. I said, I'm going to keep going. I used your resources. I uh, came back to coaching and just slowly but surely she kept going, but she didn't give up. And that's very, very important. Here's an example of Brian. He actually took our course uh, just before the pandemic. Uh, we are back to in-person classes, uh, certainly in certain in some cities. We also have live online classes, which is super convenient. They are a lot more interactive than we have today. And he said, oh, I'm starting my new job at Google. And uh, I, I have two months, literally two months, and I need a very high score for my profile, for where I want to go. Uh, and it took him uh, literally six weeks of classes. Within the next week after the class, he took the test. He got a score of 760. So it is all possible if you are committed. Everybody's going to have a different journey. In fact, everybody will have perhaps even a different resource. For many people, about 90% of our clients, a live course is the best option. Because a live course gives you so much interaction. You meet now. We started the class yesterday. It was so much fun, honestly. We had a few people in a class, a few people online, everybody made friends, and you're just you're working with people who are in the same, um, going through the same experience. However, if you're really busy and you can't come to a live class, you can also watch our class in recordings, still work with the instructor. This is our the mastery on demand option. We even offer a very affordable GMAT Express self-study option, where essentially you just get access to our resources and we teach you all the strategies. And once you compare this, we actually had a few people take this course and another course or some of the other courses that uh, they found the GMAT club and be the GMAT and they say, oh my gosh, this is like a completely different level because the things you teach us are the things that those courses didn't. They were mostly focusing on the basics, but the basics is just an extra add-on. It's, it's a free add-on to the course, but you really teach us the strategies. So ladies and gentlemen, where do we go from here? Well, I guess that's a question for you. There are a few options you can, of what you can do. You can come to our live class if you're really committed and you know that you are the kind of person who wants to become a future leader. If you are still exploring and if you don't know whether MB is right for you, then please connect with Christopher. He's going to come in in just literally a moment and uh, he'll share with you a few tips and strategies of how to apply to a business school. Come to our master fresher class, which is going to be in approximately four weeks. Uh, take a GMAT practice test just to get a taste of what it's actually like to do the GMAT. And uh, you can find all of that at admitmaster.com forward slash offer. One of the things I found from uh, one of my coaches is that once you actually get very curious about something, you want to make a decision about something, you should never leave the site of your goal without taking the next step. So ladies and gentlemen, before I let you go, I want to ask you, what's the next step for you? Let me know. Let me know if you want to chat. I'd love to chat. Just like I said, I'm retired. I teach GMAT classes. I teach these workshops. I love talking to people. I met many of you at different MBA events. I hope to meet many of you at our classes or in different uh, MBA events as well. So let me know if you'd like to chat. In the meantime, Chris, are you there? Can you please come in? Uh, and I will uh, ask, uh, I will answer here a question. Where can we sign up? to take the exam? Is there a link where we can use, which we can use to sign up for the in-person exam or the online exam? Yes, absolutely, mba.com. That's where you sign up to take the real test. And I'm going to post a link of where you can actually uh, get the resources. You can try our courses for free. Uh, you can try this GMAT Express course completely free. Uh, you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one consultation. So lots, lots of free resources you can find on our website. But I know that the GMAT is, as much as I love the GMAT, honestly, I, I do. I have my MBA, but I quit my corporate career to teach the GMAT because I love the exam so much. It's just so challenging and so interesting. This is not the only factor that goes into the decision. So uh, I would like to give you a really warm welcome to Chris, Chris Wise from the John Molson School of Business, who is going to share with you some very wise thoughts about what does it actually take to get into a top business school. So Chris, please unmute yourself uh, and 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. All right. Okay. So uh, yes, I, I think that your energy is infectious, uh, Sergey. Um, today I've had a really long day, and I stretched twice. I like to stretch because I sit, but I'm also staying. You know, I'm standing. I'm standing right now. I'm at home, uh, and um, I think it's really important to prepare yourself to take the time that you need to make sure that your body is ready for the long day ahead of it. Um, and so, you know, you got to you got to make sure to take care of yourself, to take the time to uh, prepare your mind and your body. So I'm being very metaphorical here, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And and, and Sergey, you mentioned that you, you know, your passion for for GMAT, you live. I, I imagine you going to sleep uh, and thinking of, you know, a new GMAT question or something. And what what kind of talent, what kind of um, uh, brain <laughs> muscles it will flex. But um, I try to I, teach my five-year-old some GMAT questions. Oh, well, there you go. Actually, oh, yeah. She actually gets some of them, surprisingly. <laughs> and I tell her, look, my 25-year-old students sometimes don't get it on the first yeah. attempt, but you get it already. Just, <clears throat> your daughter's only at like what? Like She's only five. Six, 609, 690 maybe? <laughs> yeah. Like, um, but yeah, so what I like to do. Sorry? Sorry? She doesn't know how to read yet, but she certainly knows how to answer. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Um, so um, you mentioned your passion and that you like, you know, that you like to uh, disseminate, uh, spread the good word about the GMAT. But also, you know, for me, I like to, I like to connect with people. My favorite part of the job is making sure that um, you know that graduate graduate studies is right for them, um, and if it is right for them, that that they're setting setting themselves up for success. Right, so uh, making sure you understand what you're getting yourself into. This applies to the GMAT. This applies to graduate studies in general. Um, you know, bringing, putting your best foot forward, bringing your best self, your your most prepared self. So um, I know that you know I, I know that it's 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 getting late for for a lot of us. Um, I, I the main message of of what I'm going to be showing is or or conveying is uh, get in touch. I'm going to give you a snapshot about tips and tricks for graduate admissions. It's not a, um, a you know a comprehensive or in-depth uh, look, of course. It's just a presentation. I'm going to try and share my screen. Let me know if this works, because uh, I do have a PowerPoint, PowerPoint slideshow. I'm going to share this. Let me know if you see the PowerPoint presentation. Is that good, Sergey? Or thumbs up? Yes, yes, we do. It's all great. Okay. Yes. You don't see my notes and stuff? Uh, no, no, just see tips and tricks. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, I, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, by the way, uh, I love your tips and tricks. So okay, I, well, I, I've seen this many times. And yes. I always find them amusing, but also super helpful. Yes, uh, it, it's it's you know it's about self exploration and self um, uh, putting the, putting oneself through pain in order to find the game. And so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about John Molson's admissions tips and tricks. There's a a better photo of me than what you're seeing right now live. Uh, but uh, the main point of this will be a, just a glimpse into the things you need to consider, as, as Sergey is saying, the things you need to consider uh, on this journey. Uh, get in touch with me. I'll have this information at the end of the presentation as well in terms of getting in touch with me, getting in touch with us. And actually, uh, usually my colleague, Kevin, uh, who takes more, it takes care of more of the MBA programs. Uh, he usually does this, uh, this follow-up information session. Uh, with Sergey, I represent a bit more of the the research based uh, masters, the specialized masters and the PhD. However, we you know we could talk about all programs. It's all um, it's it's about finding the right program. Whether the MBA is right for you, whether the uh, a specialized masters is right for you, that's the important thing uh, to discover. But all of our masters programs require the GMAT. There are some waivers, and that's the biggest question we get. Of course, is how do I avoid doing everything that Sergey told us was beneficial. Uh, and getting a GMAT waiver, but uh, really, uh, you know, what I've heard is, is you know, for example, the uh, the research-based programs at the John Wilson School of Business may offer some waivers versus the MBA, which is more strict. However, when you talk to the the program directors of these programs, they'll always say the students in my I gave away some waivers, you know, based on a high GPA or whatever. But I noticed that the people who did not take the GMAT did not do as well in our program, right? So the GMAT is a really valuable tool in itself. It's a 
it's boot camp, I guess, and uh, it gets you ready for 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 getting your your mind, getting, shaking out the rust and getting your mind ready and, and analytical and um, yeah, in shape basically. So what we do at the in terms of admissions is we look at uh, we have a holistic approach to our admissions, and that means that we will not just look at your GMAT score, but if you do get a 750. Uh, like like Sergey, then we will be quite impressed. We'll say, oh, okay, uh, but also if you st score strongly in your, your in your academic past, in your in your degrees, uh, bachelor's or master's degrees, certificates, whatever, we'll look at all these things. We'll look at your le your leadership, your academic potential. We'll look at how you got involved outside of the classroom or how you got involved in your community. Maybe you're a sports coach, so we'll look at all these elements to make sure that you that that first of all, the, the program is the right fit for you and that you're the right fit for the program. So that's why we always talk about the fit and uh, what, you know, again, the, the purpose of, of uh, what I do is making sure that you understand why a certain program will help you to get where you want to go. And um, this will, you, you need to think about this first before you submit your application because uh, as Sergey is saying, you need to prepare, you need to think about, okay, uh, how do I approach this? And that will benefit the, or that will increase the strength of your application if you're able to justify uh, why you need graduate studies, why this program is gonna help you get to where you wanna go, and also um, why you're right for the program and, and that the, the program will benefit from your energy, from your experience and all that. So, uh, so we do take a holistic approach. So even if you have a lower GPA, don't worry about it. You can compensate that with whether it's a strong GMAT score or maybe your references are very strong or maybe your statement of purpose is very effective and, and convincing. So all these elements will be take, taken into consideration. But as I go through this, uh, this slideshow, uh, the overall, the art, you know, the 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 different tips uh, that, that I'm going to present are really enveloped by this first tip, which is figure out the reason why. Why do you need to? Uh, <laughs> why do you need to do graduate studies? Why do I need to um, uh, listen to Sergey in terms of the tips and tricks for for the GMATs? You know, figure out what you need to achieve. And what you need to put forward, you want to put your best foot forward. But what does that look like? And who are you? Uh, and who? Um, and what? Can, what qualities can I highlight uh, to get into a, a top business program? So, you want to figure out your your current situation, your strengths, but also what you need. Again, why is this program going to help you? You want to think about, of course, your professional goals, but even personal goals. Sometimes, uh, over the uh, overcoming these challenges. Uh, is is more uh, personally stimulating. Some people are lifelong learner, learners, just like Sergey, and uh, we, you know, we 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 want to make sure that we're stimulating not only our career career progression but also our our personal aims and objectives. And again, figure out which is the right program for you. You know, so there are many different types of programs out there, and you want to make sure it's not like the undergraduate level where maybe you can change your minor or maybe you can. Uh, you know, we, there's a little bit more wiggle room. At the graduate level, you want to know why you're going to be, you, you're going to want to know why you're there because you're going to want to hit the ground running. You're going to want to get the most out of the program as possible, including the people around you, your network that you can grow. Uh, so you want to make, be in the right type of program. And also you want to make sure that you're, uh, you're you know, you're uh, not going to question yourself. So the, so the questioning should become, come beforehand. Stop around, look at different programs, look at different universities, make sure that you're finding the right program. We're not interested in getting as many people as possible through the door. We're interested in getting the right people in through the door. Okay. So making sure that you're deliberate, not, not deliberate, but that you know what you are, uh, what your goal is, what the admissions committee will be able to see that. They'll be able to see your conviction, they'll be able to see your your maybe your confidence and also maybe your uh, humility in terms of how a program can help you um, trampoline into the next uh, onto the next step. Okay, so we're going to look at the first admission requirement for a master's degree is a bachelor's degree for a PhD. It's a master's degree, so you're you're going to want to have a degree that meets the minimum requirement, but also a GPA, a cumulative GPA, grade point average that will um, that will reflect reflect your strengths. We have a minimum GPA, but also we have a class average. So for example, we have a B grade 
minimum admission requirement, we use the 4.3 scale. There are many scales across the world, but we use the 4.3. 3.0 to 4.3 is your minimum requirement, but the class average, always keep that in mind, these are competitive programs. The class average is closer to 3.4, 3.5 GPA. Again, on the 4.3 scale, you can roughly convert uh, depending on what rating scale your university has. Um, and also the GMAT, you know, that will take that into consideration. Or have you studied well? Have you studied effectively? As as uh, as Sergey was saying, like you you don't want to just uh, practice and, and and repeat practicing with the wrong foundations, right? So you want to make sure um, that uh, if you're still in class, for example, uh, you you want to do as well as possible in your in your remaining classes to get as high a GPA as possible. Same thing with the GMAT. You want to practice as much as possible to get a high GMAT score. These will all be helpful in your application. Uh, maybe you want to highlight your research or uh, and, and especially the extracurricular activities. So what kind of well-rounded uh, student experience do you have? What kind of also certifications do you have? What kind of, you know, whether whether you learn, you took an online class, maybe you have like P, uh, uh, CPA or PMP or CFA or anything that you did on your own uh, to 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 advance your 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 knowledge. Um, any other programs you did, for example, if you did, maybe you did a master's degree and you want to, you did a specialized master's degree and you, you still want to have that MBA, that generalist knowledge, that leadership curriculum. So if you have a previous master's degree, obviously highlight these things, any diplomas that you have. Um, so put it all in there because all these elements are going to showcase the kind of trajectory you're on, but also the kind of person you are and what, what challenges you seek in yourself. Um, so yeah. Professional achievements as well uh, are, are an important part for, especially for our professional program. So we have an MBA, a full-time, part-time MBA, which requires work experience, uh, as well as uh, an executive MBA, which requires even more work experience. Um, but uh, but what we look at is not necessarily just the quantity, but of course the quality, the, the what it's not about what your title was, but what did you do in your role? Maybe you showed some leadership potential in the way that you led on a project, led on a, uh, on, you know, led a, a team. Um, what was your growth through the role? What was your, uh, what is your career evolution? Again, that'll showcase your potential. Uh, that you didn't just kind of stagnate in one in one area. That you demonstrated uh, a willingness to strive, a willingness to to you know to um, to climb higher. Uh, and the third point, you know, of course, uh, different different elements that you can learn on the job uh, and, and in other settings. But but on the job, you can learn leadership uh, skills. You can demonstrate them as well. You can show your teamwork skills, your decision making, or your strategic skills. So these are all elements that that um, that will uh, will help highlight your strength. So when you're when you're putting your the the the, the you would submit a CV and you want to put your uh, professional experience as well as, of course, your education. And you don't want to put every single element of your job description on that on that CV. It does, still does need to be concise. And you know, most CVs should be no longer than two, two pages unless they're academic CVs that list all sorts of publications and, and, and all that. But um, you don't want to just put down your job description. You want to talk about, okay, what did I, what did I get out of this? What, uh, how did I grow in the role? So the, again, that quality of the of the um, the work experience, not the quantity, and this is what will be transferable over into a graduate program. So, especially for MBA classes or executive MBA classes, the 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 students are bringing in their past experience or professional experience in order to uh, you know to, to to work together and 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 learn from each other. Whereas, for example, our research based programs, including our our master, both our masters and our PhD, they don't require any work experience. Uh, so you can come straight from a bachelor's or a master's degree into the next uh, academic level. But if you do have work experience, showcase that. What you know again, what kind of skills uh, did it give you? What kind of transferable skills uh, can it carry over into graduate studies? Okay, highlight personal achievements. This kind of ties into the extracurriculars as well. Kind of like what your what you, what kind of person you are outside of the classroom, outside of school. Uh, even so, maybe you're, you know, maybe you you ran a marathon, maybe you play a musical instrument, um, maybe you volunteer and you're passionate about uh, 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 green alleyways and all that, or maybe you're an entrepreneur, or maybe whether it's a smaller business, uh, a very small business to a to a, you know a, a growing business. Uh, these are all these are all elements that can showcase um, the you know a, a bit more of the. Uh, 
broader, broader leadership skills in general and the broader um, uh, teamwork skills as well. So if you're talking about, you know, I, I coach soccer uh, or whatever, uh, these are these are skills that again you can you can you can bring forth in your CV as well as well as highlighting it in your letter of intent or what we call a statement of purpose. So in this statement of purpose, it's a really important admission requirement because um, yes, you know, you're going to submit your transcripts. Yes, you're going to submit your GMAT score. Yes, you're going to submit um, your CV. But then when it comes to the statement of purpose, you really want to be able to tie all these elements together and it's your chance to really market yourself. So yes, talking about where you're coming from and where you want to go, again, why this program is going to be right for you and highlighting uh, these are my strengths, this is what I can bring to the program, but this is where I, you know, I'm feeling I'm, I'm hitting a, a, a wall, you know, for example, maybe you're, some people may learn, they don't need to go to graduate school if they're learning as, as much as they need on the job. You can equally learn as much on the job as you can in a classroom, but uh, some people will feel like, you know what, oh, I'm, I'm hitting this, this, this barrier, I need, um, you know, graduate studies, whether through an MBA or a research specialized program, I need that, I need to top up and, and get around this obstacle. So um, in your statement of purpose, you'll be able to explain what, you know, again, why this program is going to help you get to where you want to go. The next point is about being concise. Um, so yes, be genuine, be, um, be, be, be able to promote your strengths, but also be humble about, uh, again, the, the areas where you need improvement, but be concise. Again, with the, with the resume, it's uh, no more than two pages usually. The statement of purpose, it's about 500 words. You can go slightly over that, but the, the, the point is, is to be, to be punchy, to be, um, uh, to be able to show, again, in being concise, how you can articulate your ideas, how you can present yourself, and how you understand your trajectory and where the where the program, where the graduate program fits within your career trajectory and your life trajectory. And the thing that I, I tend to uh, emphasize, and I, I host a longer admissions trip, tips, tips and tricks session, um, uh, and I think I say this about four times, is about, you know, just check the spelling, reread it 14 times, uh, have other, someone else read it, get feedback. Um, so, you know, you want to you want to take the time with an application and there, you know, you, you don't want to be submitting at the last minute. You want to make sure that uh, you are putting every, you know, you're showcasing your um, uh, showcasing, showcasing as much as possible to um, uh, to put yourself on the top of that pile of applications. And also, I should note that we have competitive programs, um, but also every year, basically, it depends on who you're up against in that year. So maybe the caliber is even stronger. So even if you meet the minimum admission requirements, you, uh, you may, that's no guarantee that you're going to get into the program. So uh, with the GMAT, I don't know if, if uh, Sergey, you've mentioned this, but for our program, uh, for our master's programs, we require a minimum of 580. However, the class average is closer to 640, 650, again, depending on the year. So you want to aim for that higher, uh, you know, to surpass that kind of stuff. You want to you want to make sure that you're um, not only improving your chances of getting accepted into the program, but also there may be some scholarships and awards that will go to people who have a stronger profile. So again, all this stuff will help. Um, and um, okay, so we're already into references. So I, I, I um, went a bit long on that one, but in terms of references, again, another element that is important is that you you need to um, not just ask potential referees whether they, can, whether they can give you a reference, but can they give you a strong reference? Uh, talk to them about, you know, ideally some people have been out of school for 20 years and it's a little bit hard for them to, uh, to jog the memory of the, their professors if they're still around, but um, basically you want to try and find someone who knows you well, whether that's professionally or academically and whether they can give you a, a strong reference. Maybe you did well on a project or in their class, or you know, maybe you, you, you managed a team well, whatever it is, uh, you can discuss with them the elements that you'd like to highlight. And you have a chance to submit up to three references. Uh, so maybe you can be strategic in, in, in how the different references can showcase the different elements um, or the different qualities that you bring to the program, all while having a common theme that that you're, you're really, the skills really transfer and are transferable to uh, success in graduate school. And then, uh, yeah, you definitely want to talk to the, to the, uh, to your potential referee about, about the program, about why you're applying. 
again, all these things will help the referee write a, a better reference. Usually the people that you'd be asking uh, to, to provide a reference, whether it's an employer or a, a past teacher or supervisor, that um, you know, they usually know they, they've probably done a reference letter before, but it's always good to just talk about it so that they understand a little bit more about the fine, the fine, uh, the finer elements of your um, of your application, of your candidacy, and of your strengths. I'm just going to take a drink of water here. So the interview, no real mind blowing uh, revelations here. I mean, it's a, it's an interview. Not a lot of programs will require an interview. Basically, some some programs like the the MBA has a video interview, so you're uh, you're responding to prompt questions and being recorded. Uh, others are maybe virtual meetings or, or or interviews with an individual, the program director, or even a, a committee. But the same applies as you you know you think about this kind of interview as you would a, any job interview. Uh, you want to be punctual, punctual and prepared. You want to check your tech, so making sure that you're your Zoom is working or your camera is working. Um, and also you want to, you know, you want to dress the parts, you want to dress uh, professionally, articulate well, uh, and also know what you wrote in the application. So you want to understand the questions that they may ask you based on your application that you submitted. Uh, but also you want to show not only in your application, and this should, shouldn't only happen at the interview. And don't think that the interview is going to save you from a poor application, right? Once you put together a, a strong application where you have strong justifications and an understanding of why uh, you should be applying to this program and why this program should accept you, then the interview will be a breeze, right? So it's not like you're you're submitting an application and then you got to prepare completely differently for the interview. The interview is just a follow up on the application that you presented, and you're going to be able to add to it or or you know the 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 interviewer may just want to see how you how you present yourself um you know in person or verbally uh, versus on paper so uh, and also pair of questions for them again this is a common tip for for interviewing so it'll show that you've done your homework about what the program is what the university is you know in a professional setting about what the company is so it's all similar um as it says at the top there, just treat it like a job interview and um, should go fine. Okay, and then yes, uh, definitely uh, tip eight, um, and you know, there's numbers to these tips, but they all apply. Basically making sure that you, making sure that you understand the school, understand not only what the recruiter is telling you about the school, like myself, I'm a recruiter, I can talk about these programs, but I've never been in the program. So, um, you know, I work on the website, I work on trying to make sure the communication is as thorough and comprehensive as possible, but I still, so after you check the website, and I hope you research different programs first by going to the website and getting a bit of an understanding of what the different programs are, so that you can then come to uh, a recruiter like myself or an advisor and ask, Okay, well, I'm not too sure if, if this right this program is right for me. This is where I'm coming from, and can you give me some advice on that? So this this will help. And again, I'll, you know, a person like myself would be able to discuss what what trajectory might suit you or fit your objectives better. So again, important to to do your back you know your background uh, research and then consult with not only a recruiter like myself or an advisor, but then as it says in the third, talk to students in the program. So I've never been in one of our John Molson programs, um, but uh, I have a master's degree, but I am not through the John Molson School of Business. I've never been in that program. Uh, so it's better if you're able to talk to students who are currently in the program or ambassadors or alumni who are ambassadors. Uh, so uh, yeah, just get as much information as possible. Again, this is a big decision room. Grad school is not, uh, you shouldn't just kind of slip into grad school like you may have done into uh, um, into undergraduate school. You don't have to rush into graduate school. People people come from, you know, maybe they're maybe they're forty, maybe they're, uh, you know, further along. Um, people come to grad school when they need to come to grad school, and uh, again, this is why you need to think about it and talk to others about how what they found in 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 the program and why they found it useful to to help you make that decision. Okay, so let's talk about that decision. This is a, I'm, I'm not going to get into too much detail about this slide, but the importance of it is making sure that you're picking the right program uh, for uh, you know for your your career objectives. Whether it's a professional program like an MBA or the 
uh, executive MBA or the MBA in investment management. So these are more generalist degrees that you can carry to any sector that you can, um, you know, the, the, where you could bring your work experience into the classroom and talk and, and talk about that experience, build upon that experience and work on your presentation skills, your critical thinking skills. There's going to be a lot of group work and you're going to interact in classes. These are not undergraduate classes with 300 students. They're smaller programs where there's nowhere to hide in the classroom. You want to get involved. You want to uh, bring your point across or bring your point of view, but then also um, be ready to learn from others. So in most of these cases, um, you, you will learn as much from the fellow students as you will from uh, from the classes and from the professors, especially at the executive MBA level, which is an, an MBA that's for people who are further along in their careers, so maybe 12 to 15 years of work experience. They have some management experience, but they're coming back to the MBA. And you can imagine that they're they're in the classroom with VPs and and directors and people who are a lot more vet. So so what you're learning from them is 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 especially crucial. The network you're developing in that class is especially crucial as well. But you want to make sure that well, you know what? I want to be able to um, bring these these broad skills. I want to be become an entrepreneur, for example, or a consultant. You're going to be learning about many aspects of business administration. So you'll have a broad overview and maybe a managerial overview. Uh, of uh, of business administration, many parts of business administration. Whereas on the uh, right side of your screen, you will have uh, a more specialized, a research-based master's or PhD. So these are research-based in that they have a thesis component and the thesis component is really what gives you your specialization. Now our programs are, uh, are flexible in the sense that usually with most research programs, you need to have a a thesis supervisor. So you got to get a supervisor first in order to, to get into the program. We don't work that way. You don't need to have a thesis supervisor. You don't need to have a thesis proposal. You need to have, of course, some research ideas. Like, why do I want to do a research degree in finance or supply chain or uh, or management or marketing or business analytics? So I want to specialize in that, but uh, maybe I, I'm, these are large fields. So maybe in, in finance, I'm interested in derivatives or in supply chain, I'm interested in uh, I don't know, post-pandemic uh, resilience or whatever, right? So you want, to, you want to shape your own expertise. So you get a chance in our programs to develop and define and refine your own specialization through your, your thesis, right? So, um, but you also, of course, develop very, very transferable skills like, uh, you know, consulting skills. So, so many, many, many uh, graduates of our program will, they can go on into further academia, further research, through a PhD, or they can become industry specialists, analysts, uh, researchers uh, in their in their chosen industry, but also you know consultants. If you think about what a consultant has to do, they need to uh, they need to collect data and they define a problem, find a problem, discover a problem, find the data, uh, analyze that data, and look at some potential solutions and propose those solutions. Well, that's what a thesis project is. So you're you're flexing many muscles. Uh, in both programs, in both types of programs. So, but maybe some people aren't into research. Maybe they're not into, uh, especially maybe the solo work that's involved in a research. The thesis, you're, you're going to learn a lot about project management and personal management in how to actually finish a thesis uh, because it's a it's an in-depth endeavor. Uh, but maybe some people aren't into research. So they're more into group work and, and coursework. So maybe the MBA is the better learning environment for them. So it's really important to discover what is the right way for you to get to where you want to go? There's many roads, and uh, if you're if you're not sure about whether a program is really going to help you uh, in your progression, that's when you would get in touch, or that's when you do your research about about what the different programs are out there. These are these are the two main types of master's programs or graduate programs that uh, we offer at the John Wilson School of Business. There's many schools that offer different types of programs. And again, I invite you to shop around and make sure that you're making the right choice. Uh, so, so yeah, do your homework and talk to recruiters like myself uh, and, and my colleague, Kevin, about the MBA, uh, about, uh, about you know, whether it is the right fit. Now, um, I only have a few more slides left. I realize we're getting to 9.15. I appreciate the people who are, um, who are sticking around. But just in the way that Sergey told us about preparation and preparing rights and making sure that you're setting yourself up for success, uh, you want to make sure that you are not rushing into an application, applying at the last minute, emailing us on the application deadline. 
Um, I actually, there is an application deadline today and my, my email uh, server did not want me to email. So um, I was unable to respond to many people today, unfortunately, who may have had questions about, about their application today that was due today. Um, but, you know, uh, unfortunately this kind of stuff happens. Sometimes people try and apply at the last minute, literally the last minute of the application window and maybe their application doesn't go through. So just give yourself a chance, give yourself, uh, uh, try not to stress, um, add additional stress to yourself and set yourself up for success by preparing and managing and um, keeping on top of, especially if you're doing more than one application, uh, keeping on top of all of the steps that you need to accomplish. So three to six months, you will have been taking um, Sergey's classes and you know starting to prepare for the GMAT, but also start thinking about your statement of purpose. What are the kind of elements uh, that you'll be able to highlight about yourself. Maybe you need to think a bit more about uh, your your argument and your uh, again setting your your best foot forward. Uh, you want to identify some potential references. You want to check out, of course, you will have checked out the admission requirements and and about the program. You will have done that homework so that you know that the, the steps and the documents that you need to submit. And connect with someone like me who who can you know give you tips or you know direction or um, you know, advice. And sometimes it's, you know, it's saying that I don't think this program is right for you. Maybe you should consider it another type of program. So again, giving yourself that leeway. Uh, so you will have identified, of course, at the beginning of this stage, what the application deadline is, and then you work backwards from there, as you would uh, any successful project uh, that you would like to manage. You want to, you know, go from the deadline and work your way backwards. So, or the delivery time and, and work yourself, uh, work your way backwards. So, now, thinking two to three months ahead of the application deadline, you know, of course, you're continuing to prepare for the GMAT. You're maybe starting to write your, your statement of purpose. You're starting to do some drafts of it, uh, and maybe you're obtaining your unofficial transcripts. We don't require any official uh, test results or transcripts. If you get accepted into the program, then we'll ask you for the official ones, but uh, you can start gathering your unofficial documents. And then one to two months before the application deadline, you want to take your GMAT. And uh, because you want to give yourself that chance, you know, of course, there's no stigma in this, but if you don't do that well on your first result, of course, if you study with, with Sergey, then you will have done really well on your first result. But if you do, uh, if you do not as well as you expected, you can give yourself time to take the exam again. You can even flush that first result knowing that, okay, you know what, in 16 days, I think there's 16 days between uh, test dates. Uh, you you know that you're going to retake it and get a better score. So you, know, you can flush that result or you can keep it and, and again, try and improve it. But again, you want to give yourself that time to, um, to take the test again. If you're taking it three times and not doing well, maybe, um, uh, I don't know if, if, if there's any way back, yes, sir, okay, maybe, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, Definitely, you can take there's it, always a way back. There's always a way back. You could take it up to five times in, in a year and eight times in your life. Is that correct? I don't know. I don't know how anyone who would want to take the test eight times, but. Um, that's right. Uh, maybe, most of maybe, our maybe students you would take maybe just would. once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so so definitely uh, make sure that you're giving yourself enough time to do the GMAT. Figure, um, uh, finalize your statement of purpose. Uh, take the English language uh, proficiency test. Most international students who come from non-English countries will need uh, to prove that they can uh, write and communicate in English properly because it's an advanced level, and you don't need to study for an English test. It's more about your current level of English comprehension, uh, but you can take that. Uh, you want to tailor your resume. Again, all of, all of the elements of your application are tailored to the particular program that you're, you're applying for, tailored to uh, graduate studies, especially if you're, you're talking about transferable skills from the professional setting. Um, and you can start your online application. Basically, uh, the way we work is you can do progressive applications. It's basically rolling applications until the deadline. So you can start your application usually about 12 months before the uh, the uh, start date or the the, the, the intake that uh, you can start maybe upload your CV and then we work on your statement of purpose. You can upload that when it's ready. You'll have your GMAT in a couple of weeks. Once that's available, you can upload your official results or uh, unofficial result. So you can uh, work progressively to complete your application. Once everything's there and you've paid the application fee, that's when it's ready for, to be assessed. There's no necessary advantage in applying earlier, other than the fact that you'll maybe beat the rush and you'll get your answer sooner uh, to your application. The application fee is 100 Canadian dollars. 
And um, and then, hooray, you've been accepted. You get that you open that envelope and you or that email and you get the uh, you get the nod. You get to um, uh, be a proud member of the program. You need to confirm your your uh, your uh, you're accepted. So you're confirming our offer. And then if you're an international student, you're working right away on your your study permit, your 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 uh, visa, and all that stuff. Maybe you're thinking about accommodations. How you're going to live in Montreal. So um, so those are the basic steps of the application. Uh, we're here along the way, all along that way, uh, as advisors, as recruiters. Uh, we do have as well as admissions advisors and admissions team that can talk a bit more nitty gritty about the specifics of your application. Uh, so yeah, that's the general uh, process. You want to set yourself up for success by uh, by giving yourself enough time to complete to, to submit a strong application. Uh, so before I finish here, there's a, there's a few uh, upcoming online info sessions that we usually give. Uh, not in the month of March, though. Uh, we have one in March on the 22nd, which is for the our MBA in Investment Management, with his, which is an MBA that allows you to work towards both the, the MBA and CFA designations, which is uh, also, uh, you know, obviously very good for those who want to have high-flying jobs in the banking and investment management industry. Uh, we have our research-based master's programs uh, where we talk about the specialized programs that we offer. That's on Wednesday, the 5th of April. Uh, we have a graduate diploma uh, in business administration as well as our graduate certificates in business administration and quantitative business studies where uh, we have the info session on the following day, April, Thursday, April the 6th. Again, this is at noon. It's an online info session. Uh, you can register online and uh, and then we do the MBA info session on the 12th, which is the following Wednesday. So uh, just a few program specific or more in-depth um, program uh, info session. So you find out a bit more whether that program is right for you. Um, at this point, especially past March 1st, uh, the, the which is an international deadline for a lot of students, February 1st for the for the research-based masters. At this point, uh, international students may likely only be able to apply for um, for the fall, the next intake, not not fall, uh, not this coming fall, but after that. Uh, however, uh, Canadian citizens and permanent residents who don't need to get a study permit or a visa, they can usually apply apply after the deadline. Uh, for example, the MBA and the graduate diploma, you can apply up to June first uh, if you're a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. So. Um, again, here, here are my contact uh, my contact details. Um, the the uh, email address is always the better way to get in touch with me and my colleague. It's a shared email address, and the right person will get back to you. Again, I tend to do the the research based masters and the PhD, uh, but and my colleague Kevin tends to do the professional programs or the MBA programs, the graduate diploma programs as well. So, uh, but yeah, uh, get in touch with your questions. Um, and, um, you know, we can set up a meeting if we need to, uh, virtual or in person if you're in Montreal. So, uh, so yeah, don't hesitate. If you have any questions, any doubts, that's what we're here for. Again, that's my favorite part of the job is, is, is meeting people and, and trying to figure out whether graduate studies is right for them. So, uh, that's it for me. Uh, I don't, sorry, yeah, are we doing a, is there, is there a Q and A again? I'll, actually, I'll bring it back to the, just so people can really copy down that, that grad advisor email address. Um, because this was a quick, a quick tips and tricks session. It's meant to, as a taster uh, and uh, just get in touch uh, at any time after this. If you have questions, but is there a Q&A &A at this point, uh, Sergey, or are we getting late? Yes, Chris. Uh, so there are a couple of uh, questions there. Is, uh, Do you want I to read them out to me? Yeah, I think you've already answered the question about the English language test such as TOEFL. Um, so you mentioned that this is required if you're prior education. Yeah, for most, you know, there's, there's some African countries like Nigeria and Ghana where uh, you'd be exempt uh, because of the official language there is English. But even students, a lot of students from India, for example, ask, well, you know, I studied all in English, but even then they still have to take an English language proficiency requirement because they don't live in an officially English um, uh, country. So, um, yeah, there are exemptions, but uh, we do accept the TOEFL, IBT, we accept the IELTS academic, we also accept, we've been accepting the Duolingo since, since the pandemic, but yeah, uh, get in touch if you're unsure whether you're, you might be exempt from that requirement. Perfect, thank you. And another question is, should we put sports, arts, all of the other things in a CV or in a motivational letter? 
Uh, it could be both. Again, like, you know, definitely in the CV where, you know, you usually have a section where um, uh, you'll be, of course, highlighting your academic experience, you'll be highlighting your professional experience, and then maybe any other experience, maybe volunteer experience, uh, or, you know, activities like, like, like we're saying sports. Uh, yeah, you'll definitely want to highlight it in your CV. Uh, and then maybe if there's a there's a point of um, that that you take from your sports that you think shows what kind of character you are, then then definitely include that in your statement of purpose. For example, I'm a, I'm a musician. I play music, and I uh, I I enjoy the 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 group dynamic working with people in a in a musical environment, and that carries over into many other aspects of my life where I like to collaborate, where I like to um, to um, to be part of a team and not necessarily uh, feel like I have to do everything and micromanage everything, right? I, there's a trust. There's a so all the these transferable skills that I've learned from music since I was a teenager and and and, and beyond over 30 years now. Uh, that uh, that I would definitely highlight that in my CV and in my statement of purpose. Uh, maybe it's for you. It's sports, the discipline that you need. If you're if you play sports, the discipline that you need, the practice you need, the the coaching you need. Um, the 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 um, the awards that you received and what that meant to you. So there's no one magic way of doing it. But if this is an important part of your life, if you're like a uh, you know if you were a ballerina for for your your you know for the first 15 years of your life or whatever it is, like that's that's a big part of who you are. So just think again. Think about uh, that's why you want to maybe write several drafts of your of your letter of intent of your statement of purpose because. Um, maybe that's an element that will uh, tweak the interest of the, the the admissions committee in terms of, oh, well, you know, and, and also, just so you know, as a business school, we, we accept students from a variety of backgrounds, right? A lot of people maybe are in engineering, they want to get a business, they want to get some business in them. Maybe artists want to learn how to, you know, more about management, so they'll come to, to business school. So we, we get a lot of diversity in terms of backgrounds, but we also embrace that diversity. So, uh, you know, you could talk about your sports uh, and that might be a thing like, oh, you know, that uh, this person, you know, is uh, seems very driven and motivated through their sports. And I can see what, how they they would be a good, a strong student in this program, along again with all the other aspects of your profile of your of your application. Thank you. Rin. There's actually a very interesting question. I would love uh, to ask you to answer this question, uh, question if you could. And the question is, do you have the Quebec government grant that is offered by McGill? No, that's a, yeah, that's a new one. Uh, so, so McGill, yeah, they have the, the Quebec government grant um, with, so the thing about Concordia University is it's a public university. And, uh, and so a lot of our programs are actually publicly subsidized. So for Quebec residents, we have some killer tuition uh, because especially for our MBA program. So yes, our research-based master's programs uh, have, uh, you know, have a, a very low tuition. Uh, for example, I think it's about 6,700 6, about, and this is for the whole program, uh, for a whole two-year program. Um, again, not because it's a, a bargain basement uh, budget program, but because it's a publicly subsidized one. And fortunately, also our MBA is publicly subsidized, which is kind of unheard of. A lot of programs, a lot of our competitors, both you know in McGill and in Ontario, those are private programs and very st strong programs in, the, in, in, their, in themselves as well, um, and some some stronger than ours. But at the same time, our the return on investment on our MBA, which is a very good MBA, for a publicly subsidized tuition fee of I think it's about seven thousand or something like that, crazy for, again for the whole program. So. Uh, we've benefited for a lot for a long time from uh, from these lower tuition rates. Uh, McGill has a private program, and they're they're kind of trying to attract more uh, local students, and um, you know that that that's so they're they're coming down to our level. So we we already we don't have that uh, reduction um, or whatever it was called um, the Quebec reduction because our tuition rates are already very low for Quebec residents. They're low for, uh, Canadians that live, that are residents from outside of Quebec, um, at, you know, as well as international rates as well. Uh, and also I'd like to say that, um, uh, yeah, so, so that, that the, the, there, there, are, there are a couple of the MBA programs. Again, uh, I don't know if you've, you've, research the different programs that we do have at the John Wilson School of Business. I invite you to do so. Uh, we have three MBAs, as I might have mentioned, 
the full-time part-time MBA, uh, which is pub a publicly subsidized one, but the two others, the two other MBA programs, the MBA Investment Management and the Executive MBA are private programs. So their tuition is higher. Uh, there are some awards and, and, uh, and benefits for, for taking these programs and investing the higher tuition uh, in, in uh, what you get out of it. Uh, but yeah, definitely our, our, our publicly subsidized masters are already very uh, attractive. Did I answer that whole question, or was there another, another element? Yeah. Yes. No. No. I think you did. I think that's a, that's a very good uh, that's a great way to put in this. And um, again, until very recently, um, there was a very tough decision to make. Uh, there are two great schools in Montreal, and uh, how do you choose between an eighty thousand dollar McGill program and a seven thousand dollar Concordia program? They're both excellent programs. Yeah. So McGill is trying to work with the Quebec government to make this more affordable for Quebec residents. Absolutely, really absolutely. Important. And of course, McGill has a great name, has a great is a great institution. Uh, Concordia is a little bit more of a of a young upstart, and uh, you know we're only seventy. Uh, we were only from nineteen seventy six. We got established, uh, but we definitely you know so we're, I think we're coming up on on we came up on fifty years, and. Um, so you know the 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 we definitely I think punch above our weight in terms of the quality of our program. The John Wilson School of Business is, is a well-known faculty. Uh, it's the business faculty of Concordia University in Montreal. Um, so we're kind of always standing in the shadow of McGill and, and their reputation worldwide and their you know their 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 history. Uh, but uh, definitely the John Wilson uh, business programs are really are really good. They, they've they've. Um, we, it's a very case-based curriculum and we, we participate in a lot of case competitions. And again, the logic and the, the uh, critical thinking skills that you would earn, learn by taking the GMAT, for example, will help in uh, case competitions or case fracking, they call it, solving business solutions, whether they be real uh, business problems or sim uh, simulated business problems. Uh, it's about you know f uh, working on those those critical thinking skills and working on those um, uh, presentation skills as well. So we really do really well. Sorry, we really do well in the uh, in those case competitions, uh, which uh, around the world, both locally and 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 uh, internationally as well. So uh, our our reputation is is growing, uh, but of course. Uh, there's quality programs uh, at McGill. There's pro quality programs at University of Toronto. There's quality programs in the states. So, yeah, it's about finding the right the right program and the right uh, the right price point as well. I guess. Absolutely, and just like um, you know, just like buying a house or like maybe finding um, you know a, par a life partner, it, it's important to do your research and it's important yeah. to uh, to talk to other people. And the the, the great thing about um, connecting with the school is you all have people who go who work for the school such as Chris and you also have people who are going uh, to the school right now if you go on the Concordia John Moses School of Business website you can actually find uh, the, uh, the, ambassadors. the brand ambassadors or yeah. students who are uh, right now student ambassadors and that's yeah. that's really a great way to figure out that that's the right option for you yeah absolutely and, and, and you know nothing I mean, break, breaks my heart is a, maybe a hard expression or an extreme expression, but uh, when a student has started a, a graduate program and they're they're coming back and realizing, you know what, I, this is not what I thought. It's like, uh, you know, this is a big turnaround. You know what I mean? Uh, it's kind of like when you, get, you arrive at the GMAT and you realize, oh, I wasn't studying the right way or, or whatever. And it's kind of, again, you're there. It's like, it's a big turnaround. It's a big U-turn. So again, um, all you know, do your homework. Do your homework and take your time. Again, don't like if you're not ready this year, then just apply next year. Again, it's grad studies or the same with the GMAT. If you're not ready to take the GMAT, study a bit more and then take it take it later. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's also something I learned in the MBA program. There's uh, there's a concept that's called the sunk cost fallacy. Yes. Oh, yeah. and, and this is when when some people are already investing some some time in, let's say. Um, you know, sometimes I meet people who've already invested, you know, five years in the industry they don't like, but they really don't like it and they want to work somewhere else. They want to work. They see themselves, let's say, in finance or in business or in consulting. But they've put so much time into getting to where they are. Exactly. But this this time's already spent. That's it. We can turn it back the same way. As, yeah. If you study, if you study for the GMAT, you know, sometimes we have people who come to us after studying for the GMAT for four or five years. 
I've used these resources and uh, you know, I feel like doing something different is now, um, you know, like that, that will give me the, the feeling that all of this time was wasted. Uh, you know, all of this time you just brought you to this point. Uh, this is, it's already done. Yeah. Where, where would you go next? And, and just another thing going back to like, in terms of being able to tell your story as well in your application, sometimes you've learned from mistakes that you will, hopefully you've learned from mistakes that you've made. Uh, and this can be like, you know what, I, I've been working in a, in a bank for two years and I realize uh, it's not for me. So th this is why I'm kind of coming more in this direction. I mean, I'm realizing I'm interested in marketing or whatever. Explain these things. Don't don't look at them as 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 failures. Look at them as how you grew from discovering that you know this this wasn't the right place for you or this wasn't the right thing for you. As long as you're able to to be uh, perceptive about uh, your your you you know your the, the steps that you're making towards your goals, whether that's the scenic route or the direct route, um, you know de de definitely talk about those things because again, uh, sh showcasing how you overcame a challenge like the GMAP, you know, uh, or, you know, you overcame a challenge at, in, on a job, you know, you, maybe you have, uh, you can showcase an example where you came, came up to this problem and you you found a way of, of resolving that problem. These are all traits that, that you shouldn't be ashamed of, that you should talk about how you've learned and you're stronger for it. Exactly, you're absolutely right. And one thing that I wanted to, uh, I think we will probably wrap up and uh, and let everyone go and let you go, Chris, as well. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, one tip that I wanted to give uh, people, oh, two, two quick tips about the MBA application. Please don't, don't self-select yourself out. Sometimes I talk to people and just, yeah. you know, yesterday I spoke with one of our students who said, you know, but everybody who's applying to business schools, uh, you know, they're all perfect and I'm not. You know, they're all great, and I'm not. <sighs> you know, and sometimes we're not really good at, at self-assessment. You're going to learn this in the MBA program. Many of us are more critical about ourselves than, you know, what we would tell our friends or, or others, right? Absolutely, exactly. So and you got to encourage and, yourself. And also, uh, just to, to add to that, uh, Sergey, is that a lot of people that I speak to, uh, when I do marketing and I do the blog and I interview students and alumni and all that, a lot of what they talk about, especially when they've completed the program, is how they can't believe how much they accomplished in a in a pro, you know at graduate studies. It's intensive, especially if you're able to study full time. You know, you're 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 thrown into the fire and you got to figure out a way to 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 put it out. And um, so the the yeah the, the the you'll surprise yourself. So you definitely, as Sergey says, don't don't you know uh count yourself out too early okay and and by the way if you were perfect you probably don't need a school right you're already perfect so why do exactly. you need to do an MBA, exactly. right? exactly <laughs> yeah uh, and then and, and then maybe the second tip related more to the gmat is please do not self-select yourself out again based on just your perception of whether or not you can do the gmat hmm. let me tell you everybody can do the GMAT. If you have the right motivation, the right commitment and the right coaching, you connect with the right people, you can do that. So if you're trying to decide whether MBA is for you because you think that the GMAT is hard, then that's not how leaders think. So maybe maybe do a little bit of self-assessment and and maybe, I mean, for some people, it might be just, you know, this is not the career that, that's for me. I thought about the MBA, but I don't really see myself as a leader, as a manager. And that's fair enough. But for some of you might be, well, I do see myself, but I just, I'm just afraid of the GMAT. I would just simply say, look, I, I just haven't maybe discovered the strategy that will help me. So I need to keep looking because this is my goal. And sometimes uh, this is really all you need. Sometimes just having that grit and having that goal and having that commitment. I've, you know, I've been teaching the GMAT for 14 years. Sometimes I met people who are like, sometimes you speak with them and say, oh my gosh, these people don't even know how to add five plus eight, but they go to a good business school because they're super committed. And they said, I'm not going to give up until. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think I mentioned before that, you know, the, the, the biggest question that we ask by far is, are there any GMAT waivers? Because <laughs> uh, because it is an intimidating exam. It's it's a it's a challenging exam for a reason, and um, you know, if, for example, with the research based programs that may offer a waiver, if the, you know the 
the profile is particularly strong and high, yes, you could request a waiver and see if you get it. Um, but but you know, but I but I always try and encourage like listen, the GMAT is 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 a great challenge to to accept and to to uh, just like grad studies. So the, you know the, this is a step you shouldn't shy away from it. Like like Sergey is saying, you don't want to shy away from. Uh, getting a strong GMAT score because a strong GMAT score, it shows a lot. You can put that on your CV, you know? If you get 760 or something, you can you apply to Harvard, is that right, uh, Sergey, or whatever? So, you know, um, yeah, don't don't shy away from that challenge because uh, it's not only, it's not just to get into, to, 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 to accept, accept it into the program, it's about uh, challenging yourself and, and, and improving yourself, flexing a different muscle. Absolutely. And uh, also, I can say from my own experience, I got some really, uh, so I went to a school that, you know, that's, that's okay. It's a great school. Um, maybe not necessarily Harvard, but I got some interviews that definitely were punching above the school's weight because of my GMAT score. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just put it right on top of my resume, 750. And I actually interviewed with one of the top three consulting firms and I asked them, why do you interview me? They said, we actually never interview people from your school, but we like your GMAT score. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is getting late. Thank you so much for staying uh, behind. We are going to share the recording of this seminar. Thank you again, Chris, for joining. Um, I know it is late as well. You had a really long day, so uh, I- But I, I stretched, I stretched twice. Hours. I'm standing right now, I'm still standing. Awesome, perfect. All right, thank you so thank much. You. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, we'll get in touch. Please get in touch with Chris uh, regarding the application just to get a free assessment. Uh, because just to understand if this is the right option for you. Uh, and uh, get in touch with us to talk about the GMAT. Most importantly, best of luck in your application. And please know that we are here to help. Take care and all the best. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.